Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New York. They discussed growing heroin use by teenagers and an increase in overdoses. It's about three hours and 40 minutes. government reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written and opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all written questions submitted to witnesses and answers provided by witnesses after the conclusion of this hearing be included in the record and without objection so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection so ordered. First of all, um, I would like to uh, congratulate Mr. Cummings, who's not here today. Uh, he's been very deeply involved in the drug issue since he's been in Congress, and he's one of those people that really, really has uh, been concerned about the problems of uh, more heroin and uh, cocaine and other drugs coming into this country. Mr. Cummings has told this committee a number of times about the heroin epidemic that has besieged his congressional district. This week he was uh, elected to be the new chairman of the Black Caucus, and I wish he was here so I could congratu congratulate him. It's nice to see some of our uh, members uh, moving up the, the ladder, as others of us are moving down the ladder. <laughs> I'd also like to thank my vice chairman, Mr. Barr, and Chairman Gilman, who proposed holding this hear hearing. Unfortunately, Mr. Barr got stuck in Monaco. That's a tough place to be stuck, don't you think? And uh, this is an issue that they care a lot about. They've done excellent work, and we're going to miss them in the next Congress. I also want to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Micah, who's been very active in this issue for, for some time, and Ms. Shikowsky. She's interested in this as well as a number of things we've been working on for some time. This is an issue that we all care a lot about, and uh, hopefully there will be some resolution of some of these problems. We're holding today's hearing to explore the damage that Colombian heroin is wreaking on our society. Statistics show more than 20,000 Americans died last year from drugs and drug-related violence. Other estimates go as high as 50,000. And when we talk about our prisons and having to build new prisons all the time to take care of criminals, we find that over 70 percent of all the people who are incarcerated are incarcerated in one way or another uh, in, in, in some nefarious activity that's been related to drugs. And so the drug problem here reaches all across the spectrum, and it costs this country billions and billions and billions of dollars. Conservatively, the 20,000 20, Americans that died last year, that's about uh, seven times as many as died in the tragedy on September 11th. Nationally, drug-related deaths surpassed homicides for the first time in 1998, and that trend has continued. According to a graph I'd like to show right now, from ONDCP, heroin is the most addictive substance after nicotine. And it's pretty startling when you look at those figures. There are a number of different ways to attack this problem, and focusing too heavily on one to the detriment of the other will only result in overall failure. We spent most of the Clinton administration focusing too heavily on treatment and too little on eradication and interdiction, and the result has been a dramatic increase in drug production in Colombia. Law enforcement has said it is nearly impossible to stop drugs after they enter the stream of commerce and repeatedly have told us the best place to stop them is in the poppy fields or the cocoa labs in Colombia uh, before they began their voyage to the United States. 
Our borders are extremely porous, as everybody knows. We've got almost a 2,000-mile border between us and Mexico. We've got the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico, the east and west coast, and the huge border in Canada. And so the problem is very, very bad. The message uh, our first panel of witnesses is going to deliver will come as no surprise to those of, of us who followed this onslaught for the past six years. We predicted that it was going to happen, and we acted by providing the right equipment and guidance to the State Department in an effort to stop the flow of heroin before it reached the United States. Many of us, including Chairman Gilman, Speaker Hastert, Mr. Micah, Mr. Barr, and uh, others, began pressing the previous administration to deliver mission-specific equipment. The mission of eradicating opium poppy was critically important. We pressed a reluctant administration to deliver much needed equipment and helicopters to our allies in General Serrano's Colombian National Police starting in 1996. It was not easy. It took constant pressure to pry each and every helicopter out of the Clinton administration. And I don't want to knock them too much because uh, we, we, we've done enough of that in the past. But the problem is we needed equipment down there and the equipment wasn't getting there as rapidly as it should have. And when it did get there, many times it was outdated, outmoded, and didn't have the proper protections. Even when congressionally directed assistance arrived, it required constant oversight by this committee and the International Relations Committee to attempt to get the U.S. Embassy to use and maintain the aid as Congress intended. At nearly every turn, the Embassy and the State Department chose to ignore congressional direction. In 2000, we saw initial success with the heroin strategy. Our allies in the Colombian National Police eradicated 9,200 hectares of opium poppy plants in Colombia's high Andes Mountains. This put a serious dent into the supply of heroin coming into the United States. It was then that the State Department chose to stop opium eradication to, as Ambassador Patterson put it, to take advantage of, his, of a historic opportunity to eradicate coca. The only problem is Colombia's cocaine is now increasingly headed in another direction, to Europe. And the opium poppy used to make more deadly Colombian heroin is almost exclusively headed for the United States of America and our East Coast. We're facing a tidal wave of the purest, most deadly, and most addictive heroin in the world. Under those circumstances, you would think that eradicating heroin would be a top priority. We need to know why this decision to cut back poppy eradication was made, and that's one of the reasons we're having this hearing today. This decision to focus almost solely on coca eradication at the expense of opium eradication has clearly had unforeseen consequences. The result has been an increase in Colombian heroin available in the United States, an increase in hospital administrations for overdoses, and an increase in overdose deaths in nearly every big city and small town east of the Mississippi. Now, I understand that the State Department is now increasing the spraying of poppy fields, and that's good news. In my view, it should have never been decreased. The spraying that's been done in the last two years has been a fraction of what was accomplished in 2000, and I don't understand why it was decreased and why that happened. What I hope to hear today from the State Department and the Drug Czar's Office is that there is a strategy in place for a concerted effort to eradicate opium poppies in Colombia, and that this is going to be a top priority. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. I was hoping that we would be able to have Ambassador Patterson to testify, but we weren't able to work that out. However, as I understand it, she will be here, or she is here, and uh, if we have to confer, if, uh, if one of the witnesses has to confer with her, they can do that. We do have Assistant Secretary uh, Simons here to testify, and Ambassador Patterson is here to advise him. And I was also hoping that the drug czar, Mr. Walters, could be here, but his schedule wouldn't allow it. And, and I'm, I'm sure that they're not avoiding us because uh, the, the war uh, against terrorism and uh, the uh, attention the administration is uh, uh, paying to that right now requires a lot of the top executives in the administration to be elsewhere. But nevertheless, I appreciate those who are here for being here. And I want to thank Deputy Director Crane for being here in the place of uh, the drug czar. I also want to thank Mr. Gravera from the DEA and the four dedicated law enforcement officers we have in our first panel. We have one law enforcement officer, as you know, who's encased in this, uh, this uh, uh, cubicle. And the reason for that is because uh, he's doing uh, very important work and uh, there may be uh, uh, some danger to him if he were to testify in public. 
And with that, uh, Ms. Schakowsky, do you have an opening statement you'd like to make? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to tell you how much I appreciate your making time in the last month of your tenure as head of this committee to focus attention on the growing heroin, heroin crisis in America, as well as our country's severely flawed policy in Colombia. I understand this is the third hearing that you've had in this last week of your, your tenure, and I want to just tell you what a privilege it has been to serve with you as chairman, and I want to thank you for your leadership on this and so many issues that affect Americans. The, uh, the her heroin crisis in America does need urgent attention. This problem is unlike other substance abuse cases in that heroin is more addictive, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, more lethal in small doses and at times easier to obtain by teenagers than any other form of intoxicant. I welcome our law enforcement witnesses and look forward to hearing their views on how we can best address the subject. That being said, however, as will be clearly evident during today's hearing, there is not agreement among members on how the heroin problem in America can be best addressed. I strongly oppose much of the policies put into place by Plan Columbia and the Andean Region Initiative because they have, in my view, been too heavily weighted toward supply-side reduction a strategy that has not worked to reduce substance abuse in the United States, coca or heroin. The policy so far has largely disregarded concerns about several important issues, including human rights abuses committed by and corruption within the Colombian military, the plight of Colombia's internally displaced population, and alternative development human and environmental con health concerns related to the campaign of aerial fumigation of coca, as I said, a campaign that has failed to achieve its goals, corruption within Colombia, mismanagement of U.S. taxpayer dollars, and a failure by our embassy and State Department officials to enforce U.S. laws, and a failure of the Colombian government, its attorney general in particular, to pursue cases against known human rights offenders. New concerns have been raised by many human rights advocates and members of Congress about, changing, about the changing nature of our mission in Colombia. Congress this year authorized funds previously appropriated for counter-narcotics operations in Colombia to be used for counter-insurgency. The administration has a plan to provide Colombia to provide to Colombia and to Occidental Petroleum by providing for starters, over $100 million from U.S. taxpayers to protect a portion of the Cano Limon oil pipeline. I oppose our mission shift in, in Colombia, and I oppose the administration's pipeline protection program. This mission shift will put U.S. personnel directly into Colombia's decades-old civil war. The pipeline program is a giveaway to an incredibly wealthy corporation from the U.S. government, and we have no guarantee of a return on our investment, not even a deal for a discount on Occidental oil. I want to move on and discuss what I believe to be the, be the best way we can improve our Colombia policy, and that is to uphold U.S. principles and laws. And I want to use an example to underscore the failure of our officials posted in Colombia to demonstrate leadership on this subject. On December 13, 1998, in a Colombian village called Santo Domingo, 17 civilians, including six children, were killed when Colombian military helicopters provided to Colombia by the United States dropped what the FBI later certified was U.S.-made bombs on the community. This appeared to many of us, including Senator Leahy, to be a clear violation of the Leahy Law, which requires that USAID be cut off to Colombian military units, quote, credibly alleged to have committed gross violations of human rights, unquote, until the perpetrators are brought to justice. While some actions were taken, investigations were opened and closed and reopened, the United States failed to show a commitment to the law over the course of this case. Meanwhile, troubling information came out in the testimony of witnesses in the press. Colombian personnel directly involved in the operation over Santo Domingo have testified that they were given the coordinates to drop the bombs on Santo Domingo by a U.S. contractor called AirScan. AirScan was under contract to provide security to Occidental Oil. Over two years after the bombing and almost two years uh, ago, I met with U.S. Ambassador to Colombia, Ann Patterson. I raised the case of Santo Domingo. Ambassador Patterson urged me to be patient. She acknowledged that she was on, quote, thin ice 
on this one, unquote, and that very soon she hoped there would be major progress on this case. That was in February of 2001. Ambassador Patterson waited one year and nine months from them and almost four years from the time of the attack on Santo Domingo to recommend to the State Department that the Leahy Law be invoked and aid to the Colombian Air Force unit implicated in the case be suspended. That is her recommendation. I don't know yet if that has been uh, followed through on. Granted, even if she wanted to do so sooner, she may have been prevented from taking action because of the Bush administration's disinterest in this case. I challenge any member and any representative of the State Department to say that this is an example of leadership and a commitment to human rights and upholding U.S. laws. We are rewarding an oil company that hired a contractor to work with a corrupt military by providing that same company with over a hundred million million dollars in security aid, and according to the Secretary of State, we are rewarding the military involved in this case and countless other massacres of innocent civilians with additional U.S. aid. This case is an embarrassing and shameful blemish on the United States. To me, it symbolizes all that is wrong with our policy and our priorities in Colombia. I think it's too bad that Ambassador Patterson, who I do have a great deal of respect for, but I'm sorry that she's not here to answer questions on this important case. Mr. Chairman, these are just some of the important issues today's hearing should be considering. I intend to use my time for questions on these issues, and I welcome our witnesses, look forward to their testimony, and appreciate your indulgence in allowing me to make this lengthy opening statement. Thank you. I uh, thank you. I th although I, I agree with a great uh, deal of your statement and disagree with some of it, uh, uh, I think since you're so conversant with the issue, it's, uh, it's worth it to listen to what you have to say. Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for arranging this important hearing today. Uh, I think it's very timely as we discuss where we stand on Colombian heroin and our U.S. aid problems, which are Codel, Codel Bar, and covered on a recent visit to that beleaguered nation. Colombia's uh, capital is only three hours from Miami. And what happens there, of course, impacts all of us. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that my October 1st letter to ONDCP Director John Walters on the heroin crisis in America be included in the record. Yeah, without which, objection, so Which notes the failures of his office, the INL Bureau at the State Department, and the U.S. Embassy in Bogota in tackling the Colombian heroin problem before it gets out of control. Today we'll be learning firsthand from our local police, and we welcome them, and we thank them for being here, of the grave dimension of the Colombian heroin crisis. There's going to have to be accountability for this mess at the federal level. Regrettably, our government has failed to use the equipment that Congress previously provided to eliminate the Colombian opium long before we have the heroin that it creates flowing into our nation where it's difficult and nearly impossible to interdict. ONDCP states it's about 10 percent at best. Permit me to summarize our findings from our recent CODEL visit to Colombia. The findings offer an excellent and a practical solution to the Colombian heroin crisis now before our communities and our young people here at home are destroyed. Notwithstanding that ONDCP and INL figures downplay this threat. With regard to our findings, we found that the major illicit drug crops of concern to our nation in Colombia consist of coca in cocaine production and opium in heroin production. The Colombian coca crop is the most extensive, uh, employing about 130,000 hectares, more or less. And the annual opium crop is much smaller, only five to 6,000 hectares at most. And yet today, that limited Colombian opium crop su is supplying nearly 60% of the heroin in our nation, replacing Asian heroin. It's the cheapest, most addictive, and deadliest that we've seen. It's resulting in numerous heroin-related deaths. 
as it spreads across our nation. It's already or soon will be the major illicit drug in many states across the nation and has the highest risk of all drugs because of its dependence. Newest trafficking trends show more and more Colombian cocaine is headed for Europe, while all of the deadly Colombian heroin is coming here, creating havoc in our nation. The media recently reported that the son of a major Cali cocaine cartel kingpin was just arrested for possession not of cocaine, but for substantial amounts of Colombian heroin. With regard to the coca crop, that crop has to be eradicated throughout the year since it is produced four times per annum. Opium, on the other hand, produces only two small crops each year, which is up in the high Andes, primarily Ahuila, Tolima, Coca departments in the south, and also the Cesar area in the north. When opium is eradicated in the mountains, the loss to the drug traffickers, it's much greater than with coca, since they've expended extensive funds and energy in climbing the mountains to plant, preserving near expensive, profitable, but small opium crop. A kilo of heroin in the U.S. on our streets is worth nearly six times more than a kilo of cocaine on our streets. The past experience of the anti-drug Colombian National Police that have done such an outstanding job demonstrates that you can simultaneously eradicate both coca and opium and still produce good results on both of those fronts without having to sacrifice taking down one crop for another as we regrettably did during the past two years. Since coca is produced year-round and in bigger quantities, it's necessary to stay at it all year to sustain eradication in order to get a net overall coca crop reduction. However, the same is not true for opium. According to the CNP experts, opium like coca is only a twice a year crop grown in small amounts in the mountainous regions. It can and should be sprayed just before harvest time. In 48 hours, the poppy flower wilts, unlike the coca leaf, which, take, which takes much longer to eliminate. The opium harvest time eradication maximizes the impact and loss of revenue for the drug traffickers. While in the interim, it would be possible to eradicate the bigger coca crop all year round. You know, we should be able, Mr. Chairman, to walk and chew gum at the same time. This CNP is insightful experience is based on their enforcement theory and explains why in both 1999 and in the year 2000, there was good eradication results of 80 to 90 percent of the opium crop, which was eliminated while continued strides were also made against the coca crop all at the same time. If we only had sustained the opium eradication effort over the past two years, combined with DEA's excellent efforts with the CNP going after the Colombian heroin dealers and infrastructure, we would not be faced with the Colombian heroin crisis which we're facing today. So, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the Miami Herald series in early November this year on a Colombian heroin crisis here at home be included in the record at this point in the record. It deserves our attention. Thank you, Mr. Kemen. Without Overall, objections, Overall, what order. the Co CODEL discovered on our recent visit is the lack of any political will, the lack of leadership, the lack of strategic thinking by the drug czar, and the lack of, uh, of long-range planning by the State Department and by our embassy leadership in Bogota. All of them sorely need to sustain these past efforts to eliminate opium, to thwart, to be able to thwart the heroin crisis. If sustained, along with our excellent DEA efforts, we could have nearly eliminated Colombian opium and avoided the heroin crisis we're now facing in our nation that originates in nearby Colombia. Without that small opium crop, 
There'd be no Colombian heroin, of course. It's that simple and very easy to comprehend. But regrettably, our federal government has failed to comprehend that. The CNP deputy director says this job of eliminating Columbia opium can still be done in just three months, Mr. Chairman. And that's what this important hearing is all about. We need some credible explanations why it hasn't been done and why there should be no excuses of why it can't be done. Coca eradication takes years, and the net benefits are far less beneficial than with opium eradication in the high Andes. Since the Colombian anti-drug police now have the Blackhawks, which we, this committee has helped them obtain, and the spray planes to do the job, our executive branch should now lead, should be held accountable for the carnage which we're going to be hearing about from our local police. The opium elimination results fell off in the year 2001 by more than 70 percent. Let's find out why. Let's ascertain who is responsible and then find out how we can reverse that figure and hold people accountable. As, the excuse, as with regard to the excuse that we hear about with weather, bad weather conditions, we often heard from the embassy and ONDCP those excuses. The police say this is nothing new in Colombia, especially in the opium mountainous regions. We should wait and wait it out as did the CNP and go back a day, a day or a week later when the weather clears in the high mountains and obtain the kind of eradication results we need. The CNP's past experience, which we learned of in our visit, fully answers the erroneous U.S. government and embassy Bogota excuses, which included that there's often bad weather and that they can't find the opium, and if they do eradicate, eradicate it, it's just replanted. I think all of those excuses, Mr. Chan Mr. Chairman, ring hollow. In summary, what's needed now is strong leadership and political will at the top so that Colombian opium and in turn Colombian heroin now destroying our youth here in our country can become a thing of the past. Mr. Chairman, we thank you again for conducting these hearings. I'm certain these things can and must change. And when the American people know what can and must be done and demand that their federal government do the job of protecting them from illicit drugs from abroad, and in this case, Colombian heroin, it's going to happen. Our local police departments, from whom we're about to hear from, can't do this eradication job at the source in Colombia. But we and our federal government can and should do the job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gilman. Uh, Mr. Tierney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, first of all, for holding these hearings and uh, for the great work that you've done as committee chair, particularly over the last year, where we've uh, really addressed a number of issues that were important to the American people. Uh, and I look forward to your continued uh, efforts in that regard uh, with whatever subcommittee chairmanship you, uh, you get after we reorganize. I want to, in large part, associate my remarks with those of Ms. Schakowsky, who I think uh, went into greater length than I'm going to go into, but uh, certainly was on point with much of what she had to say. The Andean County, uh, Country Initiative and the, the Plan Columbia are not uh, the best of plans that we could put forth to do what we need to do in this country in terms of eliminating the drugs uh, that are coming into the United States. Spraying, while, Mr. Chairman, you may think it's good news that they're spraying, many people uh, obviously don't think it's such good news when it turns out to have a huge internal displacement, causing probably more internal refugees than uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, and we need to go about this in a little bit of a wiser situation. Uh, we have alternative development issues that need to be addressed. Uh, if people are going to have their crops eradicated and uh, be moved on, then there has to be something for them to go to. We should be concentrating more on building a civil society uh, in Colombia, they need a much strengthened judiciary, a much improved police organization, a much improved military. Uh, we also need to know that their military right now is not uh, of the nature that it should be. We're sending down a substantial amount of money from the United States and now sending our men and women there only to find out that if you have enough wealth and if you have enough education in Colombia, then you need not serve in the Colombian military forces. And I think that's something that has to be addressed by President Uribe uh, before we keep sending uh, money down there. The fact is that every time uh, we succeed or think we're succeeding in eradicating either poppy or, uh, 
or cocaine, coca, uh, it's just moving. We did a relatively good job, we thought, in Peru and in Bolivia, and it moved to Colombia. Uh, we're now making efforts in Colombia, and the fears are that it's moving back to Peru, back to Bolivia, and maybe into Ecuador. Uh, so that we have to do much more, and we have to come at this from more than one direction. Uh, and I think that we can do that. I'm always dismayed that we really don't sink our teeth into issues that would really make a difference as difficult as they may be for people in political life up here. First and foremost on that list, I'd put money laundering. If we really concentrated on going after the money, I think we'd make the, the witnesses in front of his job a lot easier on that. Let's go where it is. It's the toughest thing politically perhaps to be done in this country, Colombia or the other countries involved, but let's go at the source. Let's go at the arms transfers and sales. The number of arms shipments going into Colombia and other countries that are manufacturing these drugs is outrageous. Yet the United States is the singular most uh, important country that withdrew from the small arms discussions that were going on in the international community, and that's a disgrace. Let's talk about interrupting the precursor chemicals that go into the production and manufacture uh, of these drugs. You know, these people are making money. This is a business. And we sit here looking like the only thing we can do is eradicate cr crops of poor peasants, making them internal refugees, running around their country looking for a food, looking for a place to settle down, looking for a way to be safe. And the only people that can go after money laundering, arms transfers and sales, interruption precursor chemicals, really, is the United States taking the leadership. And where are we on that, Mr. Chairman? Just where is the courage of this body of Congress and where is the courage of other people in going where it really makes a difference? We're just going to keep pushing this ball around the park from Peru to Bolivia to Colombia to Ecuador and back if we don't start going at the source or the root of that issue. And we can do a lot more in terms of having treatment on demand in this country. As much as supply is an issue, let's not fool ourselves, demand is an even larger issue. The price for these drugs has not gone down one iota in all the time that we've spent trying to address this issue. No matter how much we move it from Peru to Bolivia to Colombia to Ecuador or any place else, go overseas, the fact of the matter is the price on the streets of this country remains the same. So we're not having the impact that we think we're doing. We're spending huge amounts of money we're spending a lot of money on military products. I'm sure somebody here is making a buck on that. We're not going after where the real issue is, and we're displacing hundreds of thousands of people and not bringing them any more safety or human rights or protection in their country at all. Mr. Chairman, we've got a formula to move on this, and some of it is what we've been doing now, but unfortunately not an awful lot. We need to be working at the infrastructure, the civil infrastructure in Colombia. We need to be making sure President Uribe has his people joining their military, buffing up their police department so that it actually is an effective police department, doing something about the paramilitaries as well as the uh, guerrillas so that people have confidence in their own law enforcement and military mechanisms, and then making sure that we do the things that could make the largest difference of all, taking on the money launderers, the arms transfers and sales people, the precursor chemical manufacturer producers and shippers and doing something about demand in this country. This isn't some squishy liberal answer to this problem. This is a part of serious business of going after the problems where the roots are. And we should get over this nonsense about you not being tough enough, you're, you're being too tough, and get down to where it really makes a practical difference and go right at the heart of the problem. We're spending $411 million in fiscal 2002 the third largest amount of United States foreign aid of any country in the world in Colombia, and we're not having much success except to ruin the lives and further exacerbate the suffering of people in Colombia. Mr. Chairman, I hope as we go forward that if you have the committee that deals with this issue or whoever has it, we start dealing with the real things that will make a real difference as hard as they may be politically. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Uh, Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you again for uh, holding this uh, hearing, one in a series uh, to address uh, what unquestionably is our uh, most challenging and serious uh, social problem in uh, this uh, nation, and that's the problem of uh, narcotics uh, use and abuse. And uh, we're particularly concerned about the uh, continuing problem we're having in uh, heroin production. This isn't uh, rocket science. Uh, we know where the heroin's coming from. We can do uh, chemical analysis and even trace it to the fields. Uh, and we know it's coming from uh, Colombia. Uh, we know that in 1992, there was uh, almost zero heroin produced uh, 
in Columbia. I had the opportunity to serve as uh, your chair of the Criminal Justice Drug Policy Subcommittee and uh, looked at that uh, issue during my tenure uh, some two years ago. Worked on it back in the 80s, uh, Chief of Staff of Senator Hawkins. And the problem can be uh, resolved if you have the will and you have a plan. Uh, we put together a plan. I was pleased to participate with you and others in developing Plan Columbia. Now the challenge is executing uh, Plan Columbia. Uh, it's true that some of the traffic uh, does uh, move. Uh, Mr. Gilman and I and others were involved back uh, in the 80s and the 90s, and uh, we worked with Bolivia and Peru. Uh, we eradicated a uh, tremendous uh, uh, percentage of the uh, cocaine and heroin coming from those countries uh, in a very cost-effective manner. We know where the drugs are. It's cheap to eradicate them and uh, eradicate their production. Uh, it does take uh, the will both of the United States and the host country. Uh, we now know that uh, we've made progress in cocaine uh, and coca uh, eradication in Colombia. We could do the same thing with heroin. Uh, we played games in the, in the 90s, uh, uh, unfortunately, under the Clinton administration and uh, in the guise of human rights and protecting the peasants and all of the other things you've heard uh, paraded today. Uh, President Pastrana attempted to... Uh, negotiate uh, with terrorists, and there's not any way you can negotiate with terrorists. You need to eliminate terrorists, create stability, and uh, pr fortunately, President Bush uh, has that plan, is willing to put the uh, military resources uh, to stop the slaughter of uh, people, and they love to bring up uh, isolated cases of, uh, of terrorism, and there is uh, terrorists and destruction of life on both sides, uh, the paramilitary the FARC guerrilla, but what you need is an end uh, to that terrorism, and you need to use whatever military means or enforcement to stop that. The United States can provide those resources, should, and I believe will, and that will bring stability. Uh, if you want to trace the money in this, the, it's not that uh, difficult. The money is uh, provided by the drugs uh, to terrorists uh, who are committing a terrorist uh, act. Uh, and I don't care what side it is, they've slaughtered tens of thousands of people, not 17 and some isolated uh, incident uh, using U.S. Uh, uh, arms. Uh, that's not the question here. So you have to have stability and you have to have a plan. And that will, folks, uh, respect human rights the rights of uh, tens of thousands of Colombians have ha, tens of thousands of Colombians uh, have been uh, violated, and they're not being displaced uh, because of some <laughs> crop eradication program. I spray crops in my back or uh, uh, weeds in my backyard with uh, defoliants that are stronger than what they're using in Colombia. That's a uh, another bogus uh, argument. Uh, they're being displaced because of one of the worst uh, civil wars and terrorist uh, uh, wars uh, in the hemisphere. The demand, it's nice to talk about demand and tr uh, treatment and treatment on demand. Uh, and we've tried that. We spend tens of uh, billions of dollars in uh, social programs and jail and uh, everything else. Uh, I have uh, friends who have kids that are hooked on drugs. I have friends who are hooked on uh, drugs. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, only about a third of those uh, programs uh, have any uh, success. Addiction is a very difficult, uh, a difficult uh, problem. And we, we've tried education, and we're working on that. That, pro that program was uh, screwed up in the last administration. But it takes, as we've learned, a combination of all of these things. So we've got to get Plan Columbia uh, fully executed. And part of that is eradication of heroin. This isn't rocket science. And there's no uh, 
excuse for an increase of 62 percent, which we'll hear testimony in a few minutes, I believe, uh, increase in heroin production in uh, Colombia. That's not acceptable. It's not going to be acceptable to this, this uh, committee. So you've got to have the will. You've got to eradicate uh, uh, those drugs and use whatever means necessary, create uh, stability, stability uh, and uh, use all means uh, to uh, fight this uh, scourge on all fronts. Uh, finally, Plan Colombia does have uh, a good plan. It uh, has eradication. It has a stabilization, which is so necessary to that region. And we even have an alternative uh, crop uh, development uh, program and assist economic assistance. But we've got to uh, restore our shoot-down policy, our information uh, policy, our micro-herbicide policy, things that have been studied uh, for too long and need to be put uh, into action to eliminate uh, this problem. So we can do it, um, and um, we know how to do it. We just need the will to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Micah, for the work you've done on this in the past. We'll now hear from uh, our first witness panel, Agent uh, Felix Jimenez, uh, Detective Tony Marconi, Marcocchi. I, I pronounce that? Makachi. Thank you, Tony. Detective Sergeant uh, Scott Pelletier. I'm getting close. Uh, Tom Carr. I can get that one without any trouble, Tom. And the undercover nar narcotics detective uh, who's in the cubicle. Would you please stand and raise your right hand? <laughs> Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Thank you. Let the record reflect the witnesses responded in the affirmative, and uh, I appreciate you all being here today. Uh, do any of you have opening statements you'd like to make? Uh, how about you, Mr. Jimenez? You want to, we'll start with you. And, and, and uh, if you could keep your statements to around five minutes, I'd really appreciate it. <clears throat> Better turn the mic on. You hear me now? There you go, yeah. Okay. Chairman Burton and members of the committee, good morning. I would like to begin by thanking the committee for the opportunity to appear before you today. I commend the committee for their unwavering support in the fight against illegal drug trafficking. As a former special agent in charge of the New York uh, field office of the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, and with over 30 years of drug law enforcement experience, I would like to provide the committee with an overview of South American heroin trafficking and the distribution and its effects uh, to the New York geographic area. Heroin traffickers from South America are bringing some of the world's purest heroin into New York. Of the world's four major heroin sources areas, uh, South America, Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia, and Mexico, Heroin from South America is the most frequently trafficked and widely available in the New York area. During my tenure as the chief of the heroin desk in DEA headquarters in the late 80s and early 90s, DEA began developing intelligence that drug traffickers based in Colombia were cultivating opium poppies and seeking to develop a heroin processing capability. Significant shipments of South American heroin began arriving in New York in 1991. By applying the same trafficking expertise used by the peer, their peers to dominate the cocaine trade, and by significantly reducing prices and increasing purity, South American heroin traffickers were able to dominate the New York's heroin market by the mid-90s. Unlike the cocaine kingpins and cartels of the 80s. South American heroin organizations are generally loose confederations of several organizations and entrepreneurs who realize that a high profile is counterproductive and dangerous. Originally relying on relatively small heroin conversion laboratories in Colombia, producing a few kilograms of 
of heroin traffickers today utilize laboratories capable of producing significantly great quantities. South American heroin traffickers originally smuggled their heroin to New York in relatively small amounts, primarily using couriers internally cutting up to a kilogram of heroin, or flying on direct commercial aircraft to JFK Airport from Colombia. Over the time, South American heroin organizations grew in a number, size, and experience. These organizations, methods, and tactics continually evolve, becoming more sophisticated and difficult to counter. Reacting to an increased rate of interdiction for direct flights from Colombia, smugglers began transiting through secondary countries and changing methods of conveyance. In addition to direct flights, couriers now flew, flew to the United States airports, often from secondary countries such as Venezuela, Brazil, Ecuador, Argentina, Chile, as well as from intermediate stops in Central America, the Caribbean, and Mexico. In one of the first counter moves made by the South American heroin traffickers, they began routing heroin couriers to the United States through Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, traditionally not identified, identified as source countries. Additionally, the traffickers aggressively thought out citizens of these countries to become couriers, as they do not need a tourist visa to enter the United States, reducing the scrutiny given to these potential couriers. As a result, South American heroin smuggled into the United States by the Chilean, the Brazilians, and especially Argentinian couriers sharply escalated. Regardless of the route chosen, the nationality of the couriers and the nationality of the person who recruited the courier, Colombian traffickers remain the leader and controllers of the South American heroin trade in New York. Traffickers began using more sophisticated methods, smuggling heroin in luggage, postal shipments, and content, container, container cargo. Soon, virtually all the methods utilized for smuggling cocaine were adopter, adopted for heroin smuggling. Additionally, a smuggling methods became more sophisticated. The volume smuggled increased. For the last half of the 1990, heroin shipment per courier averaged about one to three kilograms of heroin. Starting around 1999, authorities began interdicting larger shipments. The average amount smuggled by couriers is presently between five to eight kilograms a shipment, either hidden in a combination, a combination of luggage strapped to the courier and or swallowed by the courier. Uh, Ever expanding Mr. South American Mr. heroin Mr. Jimenez, Mr. Jimenez, uh, if you could try to sum up, we, we would appreciate it. I know you have a very lengthy statement, and it will be put in the record so we can read all of it. But we want to make sure we have time for everybody to be questioned properly. Okay. Thank you, sir. Well, in a nutshell, we have more heroin available in the United States. It's more pure and more cheaper than ever. And about 90% of the heroin available here in the United States is from Colombian uh, origin. That's my summation to the problem that we're facing in this country. Thank you, sir, very much. We really appreciate the hard work you've been doing in this area. Mr. Pelletier, is that, was I closer that time? That was correct, Mr. Burton. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'd like to first thank you for my uh, this opportunity to testify before you. Uh, my name is Scott Pelletier. I uh, uh, was born and raised in Portland, Maine. I'm presently a detective sergeant with the Portland Police Department, and I'm assigned to the state task force, which is the Maine Drug Enforcement Agency. <clears throat> I've been with uh, in law enforcement for over 15 years. Um, I've worked a number of different types of uh, jobs from the regular street beat patrol officer all the way to investigations from everything from theft to homicides 
uh, and the majority of my time has been with drug-related investigations. Since 1999, I've been assigned to the Portland Office of the Maine Drug Enforcement Agency as a supervisory special agent. The MDEA is a multi-jurisdictional task force that has six offices statewide. Uh, in the state of Maine, there are 16 counties. Uh, Maine has a population of approximately one and a quarter million people. For that amount of people, there are only 34 drug agents assigned to MDEA. 26, 27 of those agents are federally uh, burn grant funded. Without the funds, we essentially have no drug agents other than local police officers. My office cons consists of myself and four other agents, um, and we're located in the city of Portland. And we're responsible for all the drug investigations uh, within the Cumberland County, Cumberland County being the largest county in, in the state uh, with approximately a quarter of a million people, people and it expands uh, about 853 square miles. Last year, in my office alone, 38% of our total arrests were heroin related for either its sale or possession. The city of Portland may be considered a small city compared to other cities in America, but like many of those larger cities, I can tell you with complete confidence, heroin is the single largest drug threat to our area. Many people have believe that heroin is making a comeback. Um, I'm here to tell you that it essentially has never left. There have been significant changes, however, in heroin trends, due in large part to Colombian cartels aggressively adding heroin to their supply of available drugs being marketed throughout the United States. Once the Colombians decided to market their heroin, it became cheaper and more pure. I have witnessed firsthand how heroin's increased availability has impacted the city of Portland. The most significant trend has been due to this increased availability. In Maine, during our fiscal year 2001, seizures of heroin rose 171 percent over fiscal year 2000, and a dramatic 622 percent over fiscal year 1999. In 2002, there was a 56 percent increase in heroin seizures over fiscal year 2001. And in addition, heroin arrests in 2001 rose 50 percent over 2000 and 110 percent over the previous year of 99. There has historically been a problem in Maine with heroin, but over the past five years it has become nothing short of epidemic. During my 15 years in law enforcement, I per personally witnessed the devastation that heroin has inflicted on countless families within my community, not to mention throughout the state. The increased availability of heroin is the single most contributing factor when accounting for the state's dramatic increase in heroin-related incidents, including its sale, use, arrests, and sadly, deaths. During the 90s, I was assigned to conduct numerous undercover operations where I would personally purchase heroin from in-state and out-of-state suppliers. During that time, a heroin bag or one single dose cost approximately $35 to $50 a bag for a single dose, with a purity level between 10 and 30 percent. At that time, it was approximately a, a dose of heroin weighed one-tenth of a gram. Within the city of Portland, I knew almost all the addicts by name. They tended to be poor, uneducated, middle-aged people who were in their stages, late stages of substance abuse. Today, a bag of heroin, the same bag of heroin, costs between $15 and $25 a bag in southern Maine and the purity levels are consistently in the 80th percentile, if not more pure than that. Today, due to the higher purity levels, a bag of heroin now contains one one-hundredth of a gram for the highly addicted drug. And if I could for a moment, I believe uh, you'll find a packet of sweet and low um, before you. I, I'll give you this uh, visual demonstration. Most people, we understand these numbers, but if you take a sweet and low package, they're measured out in one gram. If you were to open that package and pour it in front of you and separate that one gram into 100 equal parts, if you can do it, it's very difficult to do. Once you get around 10, you'll feel there's just so little of the drug there, or if that was the drug. The shipments into the United States are in the kilos, a thousand kilo, a thousand grams to a kilo. That translates into 100,000 doses single doses of this highly addictive drug. It's no wonder why our young people uh, feel immune uh, that such a small, minute piece of or a little bit of white powder could ever affect them. Today, 
a single dose of heroin can be purchased for four dollars a bag. That's less than you could purchase a, a happy meal or a, a convenience meal at any of our local uh, restaurants. Obviously, the increased availability of this drug, along with the simultaneous decrease in its price, has created a market that makes this drug attractive to younger people, who oftentimes may become addicted after using it only one time. The drug is made even more attractive to young adults who believe they cannot become addicted to heroin if they only snort or smoke it, rather than inject it. This myth is quickly dispelled, however, after the first use, first or second use of this incredibly addictive drug. This diet problem is a direct result of the Colombians intentionally flooding their established cocaine markets with a stronger, cheaper heroin. We can no longer wonder if our, if our children will be exposed to heroin. Now we must wonder when will they be exposed and pray that they choose not to experiment with it. Today, I can only estimate the number of addicts in, in Portland alone is between 12 and 1,500, and I no longer know them all by name. I do, however, know based on our arrest that the average user of this heroin is no longer a late-stage substance abuser. They are teenagers, young adults, college students, and high school graduates from every walk of life. It is no longer exceptional for law enforcement to have contact with an 18 or 19-year-old heroin user who's already into their first or second year of substance abuse. Mr. Pelletier. Uh, this translates into younger Mr. addicts Mr. committing Mr. Pelletier. crimes such as robberies, thefts. Excuse me, if, if you could sum up, we'd appreciate it, sir. Certainly, Thank you. I will. It has often been said, as Maine goes, so goes the nation. In this case, I hope that is not true. I urge you to make it a priority to assist officials here in the United States and abroad who desperately want to keep heroin out of the country by eradicating heroin at its source. Our children are our future. We must afford them every opportunity to succeed in life and reduce the likelihood of them experiencing the death and despair that comes with heroin addiction. Thank you. As I said to Mr. Jimenez, and I, I say this to all of you, we really appreciate the hard work and the risks that you take in trying to protect us. And we're very happy that you're here today. Thank Mr. Mar Mar Marcaggi. I'm sorry, Mr. Marcaggi. I'm going to have to learn more about you Italians. Chairman Burton and committee members, it is an honor and a privilege to speak to you today about heroin. I am Detective Tony Marcaggi, along with my partner, Detective Terry Coons of the Westmoreland County District Attorney's Office and Detective Ray DePilco of the Latrobe Police Department. In 1985, Detective Coons and I, along with other law enforcement, first encountered a new drugs on the streets of Westmoreland County. That drug was crack cocaine, which is cocaine in its purest form. During these investigations, we learned of the addictive qualities of crack. While their children went without food or clothing, we watched as parents traded food stamps for crack cocaine, and in other cases, individuals committed crimes to obtain it. Addressing this drug problem presented a challenge never before seen. We thought that through public education, drug awareness programs, and dedicated police work, we could el eliminate the use of crack cocaine. We were wrong. With all the time, manpower, and effort law enforcement spent to combat the crack cocaine problem, we now face an even more urgent, pressing, deadly, dangerous, and addictive enemy. In the past 18 months, we have seen an unprecedented rise in the use of a new form of an old drug in Westmoreland County. The wholesalers of this drug, in their attempt to assist the buyers, print the names of their product on the sides of each bag. Some of these names include Lightning, 12 Monkeys, Mambo King, Murder One, Boyon, and Brain Damage. This drug is Colombian heroin. I have brought some evidence samples of these bags for you to understand a little better what I'm talking about. These bags contain very small quantities of heroin, usually between 0.01 grams and 0.03 grams. The reason that such a small amount of heroin can be placed into these bags is because the purity of this heroin is between 80 and 90 percent. We have never experienced heroin of this quality in our careers. Heroin buyers were able to purchase these bags on the streets of Westmoreland County for $20 to $30 per bag. Some individuals drive to neighboring communities where they're able to purchase these bags for $100 a bundle, which is a 10-unit bag uh, bundle of heroin, or $500 per brick, which is a 50-unit uh, quantity of heroin. These some of these individuals are doing this so that as a way to make money to support their own habit. Heroin has made its way into the mainstream of drug use in adults and, unfortunately, in our high schools and middle schools, with children as young as 12 and 13 years old. Almost all heroin users, users tell us that their addictions began with prescription drugs such as Oxycontin and Vicodin. 
they develop a tolerance and progress upwards to heroin. They also advise us that they began snorting heroin because they believed it was not as addictive if ingested in that manner. They were just kidding themselves. Once they began to develop a tolerance to snorting, they began injecting it. After working 28 years in law enforcement, we have seen many tragedies, but nothing, nothing is more sad than seeing a child or a teen become the victim of a crime. In Westmoreland County, we're seeing it daily. My partner and I have witnessed teens dying from heroin over, overdoses. We've executed search warrants and have spoken with 16 and 17-year-old children who say they have already been through rehabilitation and are still using heroin. These same teens tell us how they are dealing, coping with the ancillary effects of their heroin abuse, such as hepatitis C and HIV. Clearly, the societal costs of, of heroin extend beyond the users and their families. Throughout our years in the narcotics field, we have spoken with individuals who have used heroin for a short time and others who have used it for years. They may be detoxed or attend court order treatment facilities for their heroin abuse. These people may stay heroin free for a week, a month, or in some cases a few months, but they will always go back to using heroin. The sad reality of heroin abuse is that we personally know of no success cases as a result of treatment. It's a disturbing reality to look into the eyes of a parent or their child, knowing in our hearts there is no hope that child will ever beat this addiction. Often people believe that this is an inner city problem, but it's not. Westmoreland County is a typical rural and suburban community, population of approximately 400,000. Often people believe that this problem is with low-income individuals, but it's not. Heroin has touched families of all social and economic backgrounds. In Westmoreland County, we have had 12 overdoses resulting in death this year alone, all of which were between the ages of 19 and 46, 10 were male, two were female, all were white. As a comparison to these 12 deaths in the preceding five years, we only had five overdoses resulting in death. Upon checking with one local community hospital emergency room, they report the number of individuals seen for heroin overdoses has doubled every year for the past three years, with 60 individuals being examined this year, 2002. I'm sure if we contacted all the hospitals in our area, that number would multiply exponentially. My partner and I are asked regularly to speak before committees and organizations. In September of this year, we took part of a, in a drug symposium in our county. A speaker at this symposium, pre, symposium presented an analogy to our current heroin problem. As you re, will recall, September, <clears throat> excuse me, in September, a sniper was killing and critically in, injuring individuals in the Washington, D.C. area with no regard to race, age, or income level. As a result of this shooting spree, 10 people died and three were critically injured. During this time, a massive effort was made by local, state, and federal agencies to stop these senseless killings. Cooperation and open lines of communication among the very various law enforcement agencies played a large part in bringing this case to a successful conclusion. These agencies were attempting to stop a faceless killer of 10 in the Washington, D.C. area. We in Westmoreland County are faced with a killer of our own. Our killer is heroin. It has taken 12 lives this year alone and will continue to destroy lives at an ever-increasing rate. Knowing now what is happening in our small community and others like it, my belief is that eliminating this drug in its country of origin will help, <clears throat> excuse me, will help all of us at a local level. If heroin can be eliminated, eliminated at its source, it would reduce the amount of heroin on the streets in my community and in many others, helping law enforcement to help the community and that we are sworn to protect and serve. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Uh, the only people I make call me your honors, my kids, so you don't need to call me. That. Mr. Carr. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Burton. Mr. Gilman. Uh, Mr. Gilman, uh, Mr. Tierney, and especially Ms. Norton, who is uh, from my area. Uh, my name is Tom Carr. I'm the director of the Washington Baltimore HIDA. The HIDA program, as you all know, is a, uh, a program designed to enhance and coordinate drug control efforts in certain geographic areas of the country. The Washington Baltimore HIDA was designated in 1994 by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and we focus on the central part of Maryland to include Baltimore, all of Washington, D.C., and the northern, and the northern part of Virginia. Um, as the uh, heading for the 
hearing here today, America's heroin crisis indicates there is a growing crisis perhaps in other areas of the country, but I'm here to tell you that in at least the Baltimore region, that's been a standing ec epidemic for years. I want to, I've submitted my testimony and other documents to you. Let me just briefly cite you some t statistics which I think point out the gravity of the situation. Uh, Baltimore's population is around 651,000. Uh, that accounts for around 12 percent of the total population of Maryland. Yet 55 percent of all the, the drug overdoses occur in Baltimore. Of the 306 overdose deaths that occurred in Baltimore last year, 86 percent were connected either directly or in combination with uh, an overabuse of a narcotic, primarily either heroin, morphine, or methadone, all spinning around the, the uh, heroin industry. What we've seen in the, since the middle 90s is an increase in purity of the heroin. Uh, Baltimore, another shocking figure, uh, estimates, this is from their health department, they have 60,000 heroin addicts. Again, I remind you, the population is 651,000 people. That's 9 percent of the population. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an astonishing figure. I wish uh, Congressman Cummings was here today. He could certainly verify what I'm saying because, unfortunately, many of them live in and about his districts, and we've been working very hard with him to uh, come up with some solutions for that. But there's some other things that, that, that sort of point to that. Uh, all of Baltimore is not bad, just pockets of Baltimore have these problems. Uh, for example, uh, you're, when you look at the high crime areas where the homicides are, is the chart up here? If you could get the, oh, I'm sorry, well, okay, I, I don't need to see it, as long as you look at it. If you look at the concentration of those dots in there, which represent homicides uh, since the, uh, since what was, what's it begin with, 1990? 1992 up through the uh, 19 uh, up through 2000 I believe 2000 thank you sir I should be able to see it I guess at any rate if you look at the pockets in there you can see that there hasn't been many changes as to the locality of these homicides and I can show you other crimes that cluster there as well my point is that this is where the area is bad and this is where you see uh, many single parents um, in fact usually fatherless households uh, absentee, they're the absentee parent, and the parents themselves have uh, arrest records, uh, drug, uh, a history of drug abuse and drug problems. Only 54 percent of the seniors in, in the school system in Baltimore graduate high school. And another alarming figure that we went over yesterday with the police commissioner, Ed Norris, is that 87 percent of the births last year in Baltimore were to unwed mothers. Now, that, that, that has some real ominous uh, forecast for Baltimore and what may come in there. Um, in Baltimore, since from 1990 to 1999, 3,200 homicides. Most of those, at least between 75 to 80 percent, are drug related. Uh, I'm happy to report that thanks to the efforts of the, of the Baltimore Police Department, uh, Congressman Cummings' support, work of the Baltimore HIDA, that we've got that number down below 300. So it was the first time in a decade we were able to get that uh, homicide rate down below, or hom number of homicides down below 300. According to our indications, and according to reports we have, um, the heroin that we see in Baltimore comes from New York and Philadelphia. Uh, we see heroin that's, uh, the, this epidemic is starting to spread into the D.C. area. We see gangs trafficking heroin and cocaine in this area. And along with that, I can assure you, will come more violence because this street level trafficking, the fight for the drug market, the fight for the drug corner to make that dollar that Mr. Tierney referred to and, and that's so important to focus on, uh, will take place when this trade comes down here. I mean, that's what it's all about. This is a business that's designed to make money. These people aren't in this job or in selling drugs because they're uh, altruists, believing that, uh, that everyone has a right to use drugs. They're in this to make money, and they've proven in Baltimore and other areas over and over again they will kill to do it. Now, as so far as the source of the heroin, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was clear to us that the source of the heroin was Southeast Asia uh, and Southwest Asia. Um, indications are from different sources, although we certainly can't confirm all of it, is that much of this heroin now, what the police departments estimate and others estimate, uh, 
upwards of 90 percent is South American heroin. At least it has the signature of South American, of, of South American heroin. Most of our distributors are locals. It's a cottage industry. Uh, they can drive to source cities like New York, Philadelphia, buy drugs, come back, and quickly double their money. So, you know, I guess they, they look at it as why should I go why should I go to high school, as evidenced by the dropout rate? Why should I go get a uh, minimum paid job in McDonald's when I can sell drugs on the street? And make hundreds. The trouble is, it's dangerous. So I'm, I'm going to conclude. I realize I'm, I'm taking okay. up too much time. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to say that, that, that despite all these sad figures I'm quoting at you, and I could, I could cite even more, um, We've taken the attitude that you can either complain that the rose bushes have thorns or rejoice, rejoice that the thorn bushes have roses. We're doing a lot of good things. We've seen them making a lot of changes and a lot of headway, but we need to get heroin off the street. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Carr. I think you made a very, very graphic argument. Uh, I don't know your name, and I'm not supposed to use it, so would you like to make an opening statement? I would. Thank you. Um, good morning. I would like to thank the committee for taking the time to hear me on the topic of heroin. My name is being withheld because of my work in an undercover capacity and to not jeopardize cases which I'm currently involved in. However, I can say that I'm a member of the Howard County Police Department in Maryland. I'm currently assigned to the Vice and Narcotics uh, Division within that department. I've been a sworn police officer for just about seven years. Howard County itself is in the Washington metropolitan area and includes a multicultural, very diverse population of approximately 258,000 citizens. It's approximately 252 square miles. It is one of the wealthiest counties in the country and also one of the most educated counties within the country. It has many, many high technology companies as well as farms in its rural areas. However, just as too many other communities throughout the country, Howard County is not spared from the scourge of illegal drugs. Primary responsibility for the investigation of violations of the control drains for substance laws are assigned to the Vice and Narcotics Division, which I'm a part of. It is common knowledge and well known to police agencies around the country that a large number of street crimes such as robbery, theft, assault, and murder are directly connected to the drug trade. The unit which I am assigned is tasked to address the drug trade in a proactive, community-based way. In this way, not only is the drug trade directly affected, but crimes associated with the sale and use of drugs is also curtailed. The majority of our investigations revolve around marijuana and crack cocaine at this time. These drugs are the most commonly seized. However, the Howard County Police Department is currently seeing a rise in seizures of PCP, fencyclidine, heroin, and methamphetamine. The focus of this committee is hearing is on heroin. Heroin, as we know, is a highly addictive and dangerous drug. It is responsible for many accidental and intentional overdose, overdose deaths throughout the country. Howard County is not spared by this fact. Um, statistics alone cannot paint a picture of heroin use and its dramatic effect on the Howard County community. Death from heroin overdose often comes from unexpected pl places. I'd like to tell you one story. Columbia, Howard County, Maryland. A young male was in his first year of college in Pennsylvania. He was from an upper middle class family. He was a promising musician and a member of two different bands. He had dreams of becoming a professional musician. While in high school, he experimented with and used marijuana. When he went away to school, he began to use heroin. As all too often happens, he became addicted. He then left college and came home. He continued to use heroin. He was apparently doing well at home. He had good grades. He was in a long-term relationship with his girlfriend. He had no problems with his parents and appeared to live a happy life. One day, he told his father he was going upstairs to study. Around 9.45 p.m., his father wanted to talk to him. He knocked on his bedroom door and got no response. He then forced his way into, into the room and found his son unconscious and unresponsive. Paramedics were called and the father attempted to start CPR. When EMS personnel arrived, they took over rescue efforts. These efforts failed, and a young musician died. The cause of death was ruled to be an accidental overdose of heroin. During an interview with the parents, they stated they did not know the scope of their son's addiction. They knew he used heroin while in Pennsylvania, but did not know he still used. The last memory they have of their son is him lying in bed with a syringe in his arm and blood coming from his mouth and nose. A trend that detectives in my unit are currently seeing is that heroin is becoming a drug more commonly used by adolescents and younger adults. Um, heroin, young, the younger heroin users are generally not injecting at first their heroin. They're snorting the heroin powder. Uh, heroin powder that we've been seeing at, within the county is generally white and generally packaged in glass vials. When talking to arrestees and informants, both advise that they usually go to Baltimore City 
to obtain their heroin and then bring back their quantities of heroin to use and sell. Also, as mentioned before, uh, the use of heroin is related to many other crimes. One arrestee in particular said he had a $400 a day heroin habit. He also stated he does not inject the heroin because he does not like needles. I think he's kidding himself. He stated he likes to snort it. To support his habit, he steals cars, shoplifts, and commits burglaries. This is a person from an upper middle class family, lives in a nice home. He's 19 years old. He said he's been using heroin for several years now. He's not your stereotype junkie, but represents a growing trend in younger, more affluent persons using heroin. In summary, um, stories that I've told you are from experiences of the detectives of the Howard County Police Vice and Narcotics Division. As I said before, I could spend hours talking about persons' lives that I've personally seen ruined by heroin. Um, the fact is that heroin is becoming a much more commonly used drug. It's no longer the stereotype junkie in the dark alley of a city with a needle sticking out of his arm. Um, heroin is now moving rapidly into the suburbs, and Howard County in particular, and affecting families that it's not normally traditionally associated with. Heroin not only destroys the person using it, but all the people around him or her. Mothers abandon their fathers, their families, sons and daughters die, and families are destroyed, all from heroin. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Detective. We really appreciate that. First of all, I want to thank all of you, and I know you lay your lives on the line uh, on a daily basis trying to deal with this crisis. Uh, I've been in public life uh, off and on for about 35 years. I know I look a lot younger, but it's 35 years. I'm glad you didn't laugh at that. because I, you know. But I want to, I want to tell you something. I, I have been uh, in, in probably 100, 150 hearings like this at various times in my political career. And the story is always the same. This goes all the way back to the 60s, you know, 35, 40 years ago. And every time I have a hearing, uh, I hear that, uh, that uh, people who get hooked on heroin and cocaine uh, become addicted and they very rarely get off of it. And the scourge expands and expands and expands. And we have very fine law enforcement officers like you go out and fight the fight and, and, and you see it grow and grow and grow and you see these horrible tragedies occur. But there's no end to it. And I see young guys driving around in tough areas of Indianapolis in cars that I know they can't afford and I know where they're getting their money. I mean, there's no question. A kid can't be driving a brand new Corvette when he lives in the inner city of Indianapolis in, in, in a ghetto, and, and you know that he's got to be making that money in, in some way that's probably not legal and probably involves drugs. Over 70% of all crime is drug-related, and you've alluded to that today. We, we saw on television recently Pablo Escobar gunned down, and everybody applauded that and said, that's the end of the Medellin cartel, but it wasn't the end. Now, there's still a cartel down there. They're still all over the place. When you kill one, there's 10 or 20 or 50 waiting to take his place. You know why? It's because of what you said just a minute ago, Mr. Carr and Mr. Marco Marcucci. 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 And that is there's so much money to be made in it, there's always going to be another person in line to make that money. And we go into drug eradication, and we go into rehabilitation, and we go into education, and we do all these things. And the drug problem continues to increase, and it continues to cost us not billions, but trillions of dollars, trillions. And we continue to build more and more prisons, and we put more and more people in jail, and we know that the crimes are, that they're, they're committing are related most of the time to drugs. So I have one question I'd like to ask all of you, and I think this is a question that needs to be asked. I hate drugs. I hate people who have to, who succumb to, to, to the drug addiction, and I hate what it does to our society. It's hit every one of us in our families or friends of ours. But I have one question that nobody ever asks, and that's this question. What would happen if there was no profit in drugs? If there was no profit in, in drugs, what would happen? I'd like for any of you to ask, answer that. If they couldn't make any money out of selling drugs, what would happen? If I could comment. If we took away all the illegal drugs today, we're still going to have a drug problem. Oh, I understand that. Okay. But I'm talking yeah. about new How, drugs. Uh, yeah. The question is that I, what you're arguing then is complete legalization. No, I'm not arguing anything. I'm asking the question yeah. because we've been fighting this fight 
for 30 to 40 okay, years. No, now, let me, let me finish. Sure. We've been fighting this fight for 30 to 40 years, and the problem never goes away. New generations, younger and younger people, get hooked on drugs. Kids in grade schools are getting hooked on drugs. Their lives are ruined. They're going to jail. They're becoming prostitutes and drug pushers because they have to make money to, to feed their habit. And these, these horrible drug dealers, uh, many of whom aren't using drugs, they'll send free drugs into schools and schoolyards and everything else to hook these kids. And the problem increases and increases and increases. And nobody ever asked this question. And I'm not inferring anything because I hate drugs. I hate the use of it. I hate what it's done to our society. But the question needs to be addressed at some point. What would happen if they don't make any money out of it? I don't think you can create a situation where no one makes any money out of it. There's always going to be a black market. I don't think the American public is going to say, OK, well, drugs don't cost anything, but only 18-year-olds can have it, or 18 and above then you have a black market for the minors. No one's mm -hmm. going to say two-year-olds can have heroin. Mm -hmm. Five-year-olds, I mean, where do you make that demarcation? So I don't think you can get to that point where you have a, a, a laissez-faire type of drug business without any profit in it. There, in, that's, that, that would reduce, even with that, that would reduce some form of, of crime, but you're still going to have other crimes there because we aren't addressing how about social the, How issues. about the overall effect on our society? The long-term uh, problem with our society, the number of people that are being addicted in our society, would it go up or down if there was no profit? Would it go up or down if there was oh, no I profit? Oh, I think it would go up if people were told that it was, that it was free. I think people would try it more and get no, addicted. No, I didn't say free. I think people would try it more if it was available. <laughs> well, I don't think that the people in Colombia would be planting coca if they couldn't make any money. And I don't think they'd be refining coca and heroin in Colombia if they couldn't make any money. And I don't think that Al Capone would have been the menace to society that he was if he couldn't sell alcohol on the black market. And he did. And, he, and, and we had a horrible, horrible crime problem. Mm -hmm. Now, the people that are producing drugs over in Southeast Asia and Southwest Asia and in Colombia and every place else, they don't do it because they like to do it. They don't fill those rooms full of money because they like to fill it full of money. They do it because they're making money. Exactly. And the problem, in my opinion, is that at some point we have to look at the overall picture. And the overall picture, and I mean, I'm not saying that there's not going to be people who are addicted and you're not going to have to have education and rehabilitation and all those things that you're talking about. But one of the parts of the equation that has never been talked about, because politicians are afraid to talk about it, this is my last committee hearing as chairman last time and I've thought about this and thought about this and thought about this and one of the things that ought to be asked is what part of the equation are we leaving out and is it an important part of the equation and that is the profit in drugs don't just talk about education don't just talk about eradication don't just talk about killing people like Escobar who's going to be replaced by somebody else let's talk about what would happen if we started addressing how to get the profit out of drugs? I think that's something that needs to be looked at, but I, I still question the, 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 the idea of if you're t taking the profit out of drugs, that doesn't mean you're eliminating the demand for drugs. People are still going to want heroin. So someone's going to produce it and someone's going to sell but the it. New, but the new addictions, the new addictions, Pardon? but the new addictions, would they be diminished if you didn't have somebody trying to make money, if you didn't have these people going from Philadelphia to New York? or from Washington to New York, get, why would they drive from here to New York to get these drugs to sell them if they couldn't make any money? Well, I think they're going to make money. I don't know how you're going to eliminate them not making money. Well, it's part of the if equation. If they couldn't make money, certainly they wouldn't. They'd do something that's else. That's right, and that's part of the equation that ought to be looked at, and we haven't been looking at oh, it. Oh, I think you're yeah. right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Shikowsky, do you have questions? Mr. Chairman, I wanted to stay and, and hear your question because I, I want to um, thank you for raising it. I think we can't be afraid to raise these kinds of questions when we discuss this whole issue of addiction and substance abuse, the attendant crime and law enforcement issues that, that go with it. And I think um, going forward, um, I'd welcome under your leadership that we explore fully 
this, uh, this issue and follow your line of, of questioning. I, I do have to leave. I want to thank the, the panel. I'm hoping I will get back for the other panels. But I wanted to um, ask to include in the record a couple of um, articles by Doug Castle from the Center for International Human Rights, Northwestern University School of Law, regarding the issue of Santo Domingo, the what I believe was a corporate cover-up in Colombia, as he states, and the killing and covering up in Colombia. If I could make these part of the record. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, do you have any further questions, Ms. Tchaikovsky? No, thank you. Um, I'd like to address uh, the... Oh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. If I could also include my questions for the, the record and, and get answers as Without well. Without objection. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Carr, you know, the staggering numbers of heroin deaths in Baltimore, crime and violence, are really an indictment of the de facto legalization scheme in Baltimore of a few years ago. Do you agree with that? I wholeheartedly agree with that. We had a, uh, we had a program that was uh, put forth by then the mayor, uh, Mayor Schmoke, who uh, was calling for legalization. Uh, they were instituted programs that were on the, I call them feel-good programs. You feel good because you institute them. That doesn't mean they do any good. Um, and it wasn't a coordinated effort. And as a result, attention was drawn away from uh, enforcement and crews or gangs were able to get strong footholds in neighborhoods and on the street. Uh, and as a result of that, homicides went up because they were fighting for turf. Uh, and that's what, we're, that's what the current administration has turned around, the police department, people like uh, Congressman Cummings have really helped turn that around up there. So you have no longer any legalization program uh, I'm not aware of any legalization program, although there are all the, always those in the area that, are, that yeah. bring that to the surface. There are some uh, drug uh, uh, needle exchange programs, I understand, still operating up there. Now, we had a similar problem in the Netherlands where they have a tolerance program, and uh, it has not helped the situation. I, no, I every drug they... addict in Europe that goes to the Never Netherlands has a lot of tolerance, don't they? Yes. I mean, that's the thing. It's drawing crime. It's drawing people in of that milieu that, and, and that uh, element of society. Netherlands is now finding additional crime. Uh, I'd like to address the entire panel. What's the purity level of the Colombian heroin that you're seeing in your cities? What, uh, and also, who are the wholesale heroin traffickers? of Colombian heroin. Is it Dominicans, Colombians, Mexicans? Who are the major traffickers? Yeah. If the panelists could address that. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Jimenez. Felix Jimenez from retired uh, Drug Enforcement Administration uh, Special Agent. Uh, uh, when I was in charge of the, the office in New York, uh, the DEA had a program, has a program called the Domestic Monitor Program. Uh, basically, what we do is we go out to street corners and buy samples of heroin to determine the origin and to determine the price and the purity. I can tell you right now that in New York, 90% uh, of the heroin available is from uh, South American uh, origin. And we're finding at the street level uh, samples that comes back at 90% pure. Uh, pure heroin. And who are the uh, retailers? Okay. Uh, basically, the organizations responsible of the street-level distribution of heroin uh, in New York are Dominican trafficking organizations who uh, are receiving this heroin from either Mexican trafficking organizations responsible of smuggling the heroin across the Mexican border, bring them into New York, and then passing the heroin to the Dominicans for street distribution. Mr. Pelletier, are you finding similar problems? Yes, sir. Uh, it's basically Dominican distribution organizations uh, selling the Colombian heroin. And what about the purity level? We routinely see it in the low 80s, if not higher. But the routine okay. is probably in the low 80s. Yeah. Mr. Marcucci? Yes, we're seeing heroin. Excuse me. Our heroin is between 80 to 90 percent pure. Sometimes it has exceeded 90 percent purity. Uh, mostly it's 
inner city youths selling the uh, heroin, the Colombian heroin. Uh, individuals from our neighboring communities will uh, travel to uh, the larger city to bring it back. And Mr. Carr, who are your distributors in the Baltimore area? The suppliers, the wholesalers are Dominicans, Colombians uh, out of New York and Philadelphia. The street dealers are African Americans. The, the uh, purity levels range from below 10 percent to up in the upper 90s. Thank you. Well, and I'm sorry, Mr. X. That's okay. Um, we don't, we don't do qualitative analysis within my department, so the purity levels, um, I, I do not know. However, um, without fail, all the heroin that I've seized or bought or that I know where it come from has come from Baltimore City, from the inner city. And who were the distributors? Um, again, it's mostly young, younger persons. But you don't know the origin? No, I don't. All right. Um, and I, uh, I suppose we uh, have an obvious response to this question. If you had a choice of either fighting the menace in Colombia or on the streets of your cities, where do you think we should be focusing our efforts? Mr. Jimenez? Yes, sir. I think that uh, uh, we should be attacking the problem at the source uh, area. I think that we need to concentrate uh, in Colombia. Uh, uh, we need to start a program uh, with eradication program in Colombia to ensure that we can uh, destroy those uh, uh, opium poppies before uh, they are processed and then uh, converted into heroin hydrochloride and then smuggled into the U.S. for final consumption. Thank you. Mr. Pelletier, what are your thoughts about that? Sir, I, I would agree that uh, the it should be attacked at the source. If your bathtub was overflowing, uh, you wouldn't think of stopping the, the flow by taking a Dixie cup and picking the water up off the floor. You, you turn the, the faucet off to stop the water. I think that speaks clearly of law enforcement, local law enforcement with increased uh, incarceration times uh, and, and such speaks nothing of getting it at the source. We continually put local Band-Aids on a situation uh, that needs to be taken care of at the source location. Mr. Marcucci? Sir, I would indicate that uh, it should be stopped at its uh, origi origi place of origin. Uh, we, we in law enforcement would make every effort we could to stop it on the streets as best we could. However, too much heroin is getting out on the streets today as we're trying, and too many lives are being affected Mr. by Mr. Carr? I certainly think it ought to be attacked at its source, but I want to caution you to, uh, by saying that drugs are here by invitation, not invasion. Uh, and it, it's going to take us a long time to get all the people that are addicted and involved in this mm -hmm. back to being productive citizens. And we have to fight both demand and supply at the yes, same sir. time. Uh, Mr. X. I agree with Mr. Carr. I mean, we have to focus on its origin. However, you cannot forget the efforts that myself and other police officers are doing here on the street. It's going to be difficult to make it all disappear, even if we stop it at its source. It's still here. We still see it. We're still going to see it. And there's, there's still addicts out there that are going to want that. Have to do both simultaneously. That's my opinion. That's right. What's the recovery rate after treatment for uh, heroin addicts, uh, Mr. Jimenez? Uh, expert uh, says that uh, they physically can recover in two, two weeks to three weeks. However, the problem is the, the mental dependency that the heroin causes to the individual. Uh, that uh, sometimes never goes away. Once they become a heroin addict, they still for life a heroin addict. Mr. Belichier? That's my understanding as well. Uh, the addiction process with opiate abuse is lifelong. Mr. Marcucci? Yes, uh, my, myself along with my partner know of no success cases through treatment programs. Mr. Carr? I can tell you plenty of success cases through treatment programs. One of the biggest treatments is uh, drug substitution methadone, which a lot of people argue is not that very satisfactory. But you can detox them in three to four days. Uh, the drugs can be out of their system in several weeks. Uh, and a lot of the uh, their whether or not they were recidivate or not depends upon the environment they're in and their own mental attitude. And Mr. X? Uh, unfortunately, um, it, it is a lifelong addiction from my experience from what I've seen on the streets. 
you know, you, I have a lot of repeat customers, so to speak. Um, we deal with the same people all the time. Mm -hmm. I want to thank our uh, local police officials for your outstanding work, and uh, we're trying to find a better way of handling this. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank all of the witnesses. It's been extremely helpful to hear your testimony. Uh, I sort of gravitate towards the uh, view that Mr. Carr expressed late lately that uh, there is some potential for treatment. Um, and uh, Ms. McClatchy, you apparently haven't had very good success in, in your area with that or whatever, and that's disturbing. Uh, but I think that, you know, there is potential for treatment, that it, there is some sort of success, but I think a large part of that, I'm sure Ms. Norton would agree with me, because um, I've heard her speak to that before, is the environment that people are left in after they've had the treatment. If you're going to send them back to the same environment, the same conditions, probably the recidivism rate is going to be sky high. So uh, that's in large part part of the problem. Um, I want to ask you a question. It goes back to some of the things that were in my opening statement. I mean, I have varying degrees of sympathy for people all along the line here. I have more sympathy, obviously, for the peasant grower uh, than I do for the producer and the manufacturer, than I do for the trafficker, than I do for the dealers. And I probably have, versus them, I probably have more sympathy for the person who is a, a user addict on the other end of that. So we go back and forth. But what are your individual opinions of, of what impact would it have if we took a serious effort to go right at the money laundering issue and right at the uh, precursor chemicals and things that go into the production and manufacture of these drugs. If we really went after them, would that make your job easier in any appreciable way? Uh, Mr. Carr, why don't I go right to left here on this one? I, I, from my standpoint, I think that's where we have to go. I mean, we've been ignoring the money. I mean, that's what the money is about. We have to be concerned about not only the flow of drugs into the country, but the huge sums of money that go out of the country, especially after 9-1-1 sort of gave us the wake-up call. I mean, these funds, and I can, uh, uh, I'm not at liberty to cite specific cases, but we have cases under investigation right now that are tied to the funding of terrorist activities. It's drug money. Uh, it's drug money. It's going to al-Qaeda sources, and it's right in this area. And I'm sure that this area is not uh, unusual compared to other areas of the United States where the, where the uh, terrorists we've tracked from 9-11, we knew where they were, and we know where, and we know that we have other elements of al-Qaeda and other radical groups in our country. So, yeah, it's very important that we do that. We've all too often and for all too long ignored the money end of it uh, because, quite frankly, if we're sp speaking directly, it wasn't politically correct. We are worried about someone's uncle who ran a used car lot, and we didn't want to get him indicted because, you know, his uncle's this or his cousin's that. Well, I'm sorry. That's where it's taking place. When you look at the cash industry in this, in, in this country, which is used cars, a lot of import-type import businesses, uh, and, and as of late, a lot of the banks, they're involved in this. DEA has had, had over the years, some tremendous cases involving uh, the banking industry. And, you know, the terrorists are going to use this, uh, uh, these, these uh, methods to get money out of the country and in their pockets and finance what they're doing. I and mean, just to interject before I go to Mr. Marcacci, I mean, you know, this stuff is fungible. If you, if you eradicate in Colombia, as I said before, it's going to go someplace else. If you eradicate in Latin America, it's going to go to Southeast Asia you know, Southwest Asia and around. I mean, that's going to be a never-ending cycle of chasing people around. But if you go to the money, if you go to the money, I think we might have a better prospect of doing that. And while you may have to do all the other things, too, you're really hitting them where it hurts. And some of Mr. Burton's question there about what about the money. Well, let's go get the money. There's no silver bullet. There's no one answer. Right. But we have to do all these things. Mr. Makachi is going after the money in terms of money laundering a major part of this? Yes, sir, it is. In uh, your opinion, have we been doing nearly enough of that? No, sir. Uh, various dealers have told me uh, quite up front that uh, they are as addicted to the money as the user is to the drug itself. Good point. Could you and Mr. Carr, you know, uh, give uh, ideas of just how to start going about that that would make an impact? I mean, it's, this is not something that's a mystery to anybody, right? I mean, we could put together a plan to do this in fairly short order. Yes, we, we have a plan. Mr. Peltier? No, I, I agree. Any proactive type enforcement uh, absolutely would make an impact. We can no longer just react, uh, uh, increasing uh, the, someone's jail time and the things that we do at a local level, uh, those are Band-Aids. Uh, I, I agree that any proactive type thing uh, would absolutely increase uh, the effectiveness. Uh, it, unfortunately, in my state, there's 34 of us absolutely desire, 
excuse me, designed to handle investigations, 27 of those are right. federally burned funded. Without those type of funds, states like Maine, who don't have a huge presence of, of federal law enforcement, and the locals just don't have the manpower or the resources. Well, I'm um, thinking more aligned, Mr. Chairman, or something like that. Why not have a national task force, you know, using our resources nationally here to just take this and target this issue and go after it? Uh, uh, you I, know, and that wouldn't tax your local police department. It would need your cooperation, obviously. Uh, and we could arrange for that or whatever, but this is a job that is, is large enough to be undertaken by the Drug Enforcement Administration, by the FBI. Uh, and Mr. Jimenez, why haven't the DEA and the FBI been more active in this area? Well, I, I think that we are. I mean, uh, we're working together with all the uh, federal agencies as well with the state and locals. But in your uh, initial question about money laundering, I, I would like to be very uh, careful on how I'm going to answer your question. But I would like to leave you with my thoughts as to what I think about money laundering. Uh, the U.S. government needs to be very, very careful in the utilization of that tool. Because sometimes, and I have see it, seen it in the past, that money laundering investigations have turned into the U.S. government being the financiers of the drug trafficking in Colombia. What I mean is that utilizing that tool to launder the money for the traffickers and following where the money go from New York to uh, offshore banks and to go back to Colombia, what is happening is we are putting in, their, in the Colombians drug trafficker cartels their money and their profit and they're producing more drugs to be sent to the United States. Okay, I got to stop you there because I'm missing you. I mean, how is that happening? Well, the money, the profit that they're making in the U.S are going back to Colombia to produce more drugs. Right, well, and that's what we're trying to stop here. So if we stop the money well, laundering, right? Then it's no money laundering. What, what, what basically we're talking is seizing the money before it goes back to Colombia. But in money laundering, you have to launder that money by taking the money in New York, depositing that money in an account. That money goes into an offshore account in a bank, and you follow that. And then after that goes into another uh, offshore bank and then probably ended up in a bank in Mexico and then from Mexico goes into Colombia. That's what is money laundering. Right. Okay? Right. And by doing that is we put him back in the hands of the traffickers the profits. We can allow that to happen because then we are becoming the financiers of the drug trade. Yeah, I, I, maybe I'm just being obtuse today and I'm sorry but I mean that, my idea would be that would be what we're trying to stop, sir. Am I right? Well, we try to interrupt that from uh, from being a viable option. Fine, but the money laundering investigation means that we are going to let the money go until it goes back to the to the owner, legal owner of that money. So normally, the money we follow it from where it's deposited so in the want U.S. To stop it. You'd want to grab the money earlier. Well, at that point, if we seize the money before it goes into the source country or the the owners or the producers of the cocaine then it will be a success. Okay. So you want to stop the money earlier and maybe take action against the people that are along the process. Chain. Absolutely. You know, and do it that way. But money laundering investigations allow that money goes to the uh, final destination. So you'd approach it differently, but the same goal of going after the money, stopping the people Absolutely. that are along that chain of the process and grabbing it as quickly as you could yes, to sir. take it out of that chain. That will be a success. Do we do any of that now? We're doing that uh, in some cases. In other cases, we need to let the money go into the final destination so we can identify the people who are behind uh, uh, in, in Colombia and in these countries. Uh, well, supplying. that's happening now. The question is, once that happens, is to shut those people down and prosecute Absolutely. So, don't, so people know there's a price to pay. Yes, sir. Thank that's, you. That's the idea. Mr. X, I don't want to leave you out. I know the chairman's got a quick trigger on the, on the button okay. here. But I mean, gonna, I, I agree with pretty back. much what the panel has said. I mean, Thank you. drug... The drug problem has to be attacked in a multifaceted way. Um, taking money and, and profits and, and uh, things purchased with drug money, at least on a local level, is a very important tool for us. Um, we take money, we take cars, um, in cases, houses, that kind of thing. It's important, I think, though, to that, that look at the whole picture. Yes, that would be a very important tool, and it would take a lot of the profit away from the people that are dealing or or importing drugs into the country. And in all honesty, at that level, at, at the importer and the dealer, that's going to be their main concern. They want that dollar. And we take that from them. We take some of their incentive 
um, to do these things because of the penalties that they're looking at. They, they balance the, the money and, and what jail time they could get, for example. So if you take that money well, closing from your bank is going to get your attention too, isn't it? I'm sorry? Closing someone's bank is going to take their attention Absolutely. too, I would think. Absolutely. Get, th that, and that way they'll have nowhere to put that money that they get, and it opens up the doors for other agencies to look at the money laundering issues and, and that kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is very important hearing. I appreciate work you've done uh, on um, eradicating uh, supply at the source and the work of the chairman uh, on, on this issue as well. Uh, when I hear the word heroin, I, I'm inclined to say not heroin again. I mean, at least it used to be expensive. Um, the notion of cheap heroin, heroin is uh, the most frightening uh, drug notion I can think of. Um, uh, cheaper, it is cheaper and purer at the same time. You know, we all remember the $100 a day addicts, the $500 a day addicts. Uh, and at that time, heroin almost by itself destroyed entire parts of cities. There are parts of, for example, from New York to L.A. There are parts of Philadelphia and Baltimore and New York you can drive through. And, and, and I'm talking about huge, huge clumps of land that where there used to be communities that are there no more. And if you trace back to the source, you will find heroin at the source. Uh, D.C. is not immune. Mr. Carr spoke about how the terrible problem in Baltimore, uh, of course, uh, edges over into D.C. We're seeing a spike uh, in our crime once again. Um, heroin, uh, which became, as manufacturing jobs, left the inner cities, uh, filled uh, the gap there and became uh, the, the way in which people made money from low-income families. It destroyed family life in the great cities. In my own African-American community, it has absolutely destroyed family life, um, where more than two-thirds of the children are born to single women, where uh, young uh, African-American men have no uh, models for, as their grandfathers did. Uh, many, many reasons for this. Uh, obviously, if there were a legitimate uh, economy in those communities, it would be different. There is an illegitimate economy in those communities, and it is, of course, uh, at its root, a drug economy. I want to, uh, I am very much for eradication at its source. You will find, for example, in African-American communities, that's the first thing they say. Go to the source, eradicate it at its source. We, we, we stand on record uh, for that. But there is a balance here that requires effective law enforcement on the one hand and, and, and treatment at home on the other. Uh, now, I don't know about decriminalization. I think you will find, Mr. Carr, in the African-American community, nobody wants to hear it. I, I, I don't know what legalization and decriminalization, I, I don't know how they meet. You know, if people are talking about decriminalizing a little marijuana stuff, that perhaps that's what they mean, although I even have some problems with that. It's a gateway drug for many people in, in D.C. We have had big chunks of, of marijuana selling uh, uh, in, in this town. I don't know. All I know is that in the absence of opportunity uh, in our community, uh, decriminalizing heroin ain't going to help us, I can tell you that much. Uh, if, if, folks, if, if folks can get what they're paying $4 a bag for uh, uh, with no penalties attached to it, that doesn't mean I'm saying, and you will see in some of my questions, that I think some of the penalties, uh, mandatory minimums and the like, have had the opposite effect that they were intended. So I'm certainly not speaking uh, for uh, putting people in jail as the alternative. I just know we haven't come upon what is the right balance. I have a question first from Mr. Carr about this study uh, from Baltimore. Apparently it is the only full-scale study of a single city. It's called Steps to Success, Baltimore Alcohol and Drug Treatment Outcomes. Uh, it's, it came before one of our subcommittees uh, last February, but this study concluded that uh, increased access to drug treatment on demand 
had resulted in significant reductions in drug and alcohol abuse and property crime, HIV risk behavior. And I want to know uh, what you think of whether treatment on demand is available in Baltimore, whether you think it would help uh, in uh, bringing down uh, crime and, and abuse. And I'd like, as a law enforcement officer, your view on right. treatment let me, on demand. Let me point out that we also fund a $5 million treatment program through, with HIDA in the region. And uh, uh, a lot of it goes back to, and I think this is why my colleagues and, and other members of the committee say, well, geez, I don't know a treatment program that works. Uh, it's just like I don't know that I don't know every law enforcement program that works either, but I can show you some that do work. We have one that does, and we measure it vis-a-vis -a, -vis a crime control measure, measure, and that is recidivism rates. The big important thing that we look at with our clients, and I might say, if I recall, I gave you a copy of the study. Our average client in our in our height is 33 and a half years of age, 10 arrests, six convictions, uh, and they're drug addicts. So we're not we're, we're dealing with a hardcore group, the group that the 20 or, or I'm sorry, the group of the population is, consumes 20 percent of the drugs and commits 80 percent of the crime. We used a coerced treatment model, and by coerced treatment that means that we that they're under some form of legal uh, uh, there's a legal hammer over their head to make sure they come, because we know that people that volunteer for treatment don't stay in treatment very long. We have drug testing. And we have imposed a series of graduated sanctions to make sure these people uh, hold the line and stay in the program. And if they don't, they go back to jail. I mean, just let me add very quickly uh, that the best treatment for drug dealers is incarceration. I mean, that, they're, they're there to, to make money. Some of them become addicted, some of them don't. But I think the best form of early intervention with them is incarceration. Slapping them on the wrist, letting them go back on the street over and over, as we've seen in Baltimore, only reinforces the negative. They become more violent. Uh, they become more uh, belligerent, sometimes as a result of the use of drugs themselves, and that's not a good situation. Some drug treatment is very effective. Other drug treatment has shown to have no effect on the population. It depends how it's implemented is the best answer I can give you. Mr. You, you may be aware that uh, uh, the Bureau of Prisons, uh, pursuant, I must say, to funds that this Congress authorizes, has both drug treatment and alcohol abuse treatment in prison. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, when you get out of here from a state prison, uh, you're, you're not in the same shape. I, I do want to put on the record, and I'd like, to I'd, I'd like to introduce into the record, and I will, I don't have it with me now, the record of uh, the, a the agency, uh, we, it's short, short for SOSA, uh, it's, a, it's the agency that, in fact, D.C. prisoners now go to federal prisons. And there is a, an agency which handles them when they get out. Uh, as a result of, uh, of that, the very program you describe uh, is, has, in fact, reduced recidivism in this city. I mean, carrot and stick, mm -hmm. yep. not treatment that says, y'all come on and, and, you know, some of you sit down and we just talk to you and you won't be on drugs anymore. The others of you sit down and, and, if, you, and if you look like you're going again, call up somebody. I don't know if anybody has ever, ha has ever liked ice cream a lot and then tried to wean themselves from it or, or tried to lose weight. But if you understand how hard it is to lose weight and, and stay off of fatty foods or give up ice cream, then perhaps you have some idea of what a truly addictive substance would be like. And I, I could not agree more. What it takes to, in fact, overcome it with all of these uh, uh, prescriptions out here is not well understood, but we do understand that this carrot and stick approach, uh, Mr. Carr, that you, uh, that you described. Ms. Uh, Norton, did you want to put a report in the record? Yes, I do, and I will submit it for the record if you will allow it. Without, without objection, what is that report? It is a report of the reduction in crime, in recidivism, 
by inmates who get out of the Bureau of Prisons mm -hmm. and come home to the District of Columbia. Right. Without objection. Thank, and let you. me remind my uh, colleagues that we have another panel that follows this, so please be brief. Could I just ask one more question then? Means, yeah. uh, it has to do with mandatory minimums. Um, I, mm. Our answer when the crack cocaine, it, it was about the time of the insert the, the, the great increase in crack cocaine that we went into mandatory minimums. Since that time, the Drug Sentencing Commission and the federal judges have all asked that this t huge disparity between powdered cocaine and rock cocaine be eliminated, that it had produced uh, uh, hugely unfair effects that you were getting uh, the mules and the minor drug dealers, um, the, the people who launder and the rest, you, you, you don't get it, even though they try to break them through the mules. I'd like to know where you stand on mandatory minimums as an effective way of, 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 of control Ms. of drugs. Ms. Norton, would you agree to limit that to the former DEA official, Mr. Jimenez? Because of time. Because of our time. Mr. Yes, Jimenez? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Would you press your mic button? Uh, I strongly support that uh, the minimum mandatory uh, sentences be reviewed, especially on the heroin uh, issue, uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, I know uh, that uh, we are locking up people uh, in New York, as well as in Philadelphia and other parts of the country, and uh, three years later, we are facing them back in the streets and more, they're more uh, uh, in control and they're more in, uh, in uh, 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 organized than ever. So basically, it's a revolving door uh, at this time. Uh, we lock in them up, uh, they do time, probably they will maintain the control of the uh, organization from uh, jail, and when they come out, they will have more money and more control than ever. So that must be reviewed, and the sooner the better. Thank you, Mr. Jimenez. And I want to thank our panelists once again, Mr. Jimenez, Mr. Pelletier, Mr. Marachi, Mr. Carr, Mr. X, for your excellent work out there fighting the battle. We appreciate your taking the time to be with us. I uh, now excuse this panel and ask our panel number two to please take our seats at the panel table. We want to welcome uh, panel number two. Will the panel panelists and panel number two please take their seats? Um, Barry Crane, Paul Simons, Roger Guevara. Let me swear them in first. Well, let me swear them in. Yeah. We'll now hear testimony from panel number two our uh, ONDCP uh, witness panel, including the Honorable Barry Crane, Paul Simons from State, and Roger Rivera from DEA. Uh, do you, uh, I'm going to ask our gentleman, would you please stand? And would you raise your hands? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the uh, record indicate that the panelists have indicated 
that they agreed to the uh, oath. I'm deeply, we're deeply disappointed that our drug czar, John Walters, was not able to join us this morning. Our committee, as you know, serves as both an oversight and legislative authorizing committee, and if the drug czar was here, he could have responded to questions but that we have about Columbia Heroin. Our committee did invite Mr. Walters with adequate notice back in October, and we wrote to him as well regarding the Colombian heroin crisis that we're now facing. And as yet, uh, regrettably, we've received no response to that inquiry. We look forward to hearing uh, Mr. Walter's staff and how we can develop a badly needed heroin strategy and solutions to the crisis that we heard this first panel that was before us today of local police officers discussing. The Colombian heroin crisis is rapidly moving west and will soon consume our entire nation. We don't want our drugs are to be AWOL with regard to this problem. Accordingly, I'm going to, this is my last hearing, regrettably, uh, due to involuntary retirement, due to redistricting, and I urge our committee and the new 108th Congress to stay intensely engaged in fighting this Colombian heroin crisis until ONDCP is able to effectively correct the problem. A drug czar is going to have to take the lead in our war on drugs. I have a high regard for Mr. Walters, and we hope that he will assume the proper leadership in this issue. So now uh, let's uh, ask uh, Mr. Uh, Crane uh, if he would uh, take the first lead on testimony. Please try to limit your uh, response to five minutes. Mr. Crane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I might add that Mr. Crane is Deputy Director for Supply Reduction in the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Mr. Crane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's, a, it's indeed an honor to be here. This is respected colleagues here um, and other members of the committee. It is a pleasure to meet with you today and discuss some of the major threats of the United States, especially heroin. Let me thank you for your longstanding and strong support for the fight against these drugs over the years and the social destruction they engender and the terrorism they sub subsidize. You have a copy of my prepared uh, testimony, and I ask that my written statement be included in the record. In addition, I have some brief comments. Without objection. First, let me say for the first time in many years or decade, there's some real hope in Colombia. With the inauguration of President Uribe last August of this year, there's been much more support for U.S. counter drug policy in Colombia, and we hope they've turned a corner. The challenges that President Uribe faces are daunting. Over 30,000 armed narco terrorists in his country threaten the safety and security of his people, kidnapping, assassination, and massacre. These same terrorists provide sanctuary for the drug production and trafficking that supplies 90 percent of the cocaine and, and uh, an order of a third of the U.S. heroin market. The insecurity bred by these evils of drugs and terror have harmed Colombia's economy driven much of our population out of their homes and threatened the democratic foundation of their institutions. But we are now in a new era in Colombia. President Uribe has very bravely stepped up to these numerous challenges facing his country. He has rallied his people to his side and against the traffickers and terrorists. He is mobilizing resources and political will. He is committed to reestablishing the rule of law in areas currently controlled by the illegal armed groups, providing security to the communities ravaged by terror and attacking this illegal drug industry. It's the fuel for large instabilities in Colombia. In short months of his administration, he has attained historic eradication records in coca and restored uh, poppy eradication. He sped up the seizure disposition of property belonging to the narco-terrorists. He, he's trying to restore the, the uh, environmental conditions of the rainforest destroyed by the drug traffickers. He's established record rates of extradition of wanted criminals. He's begun to repatriate numbers of these uh, child soldiers that were Im impressed in the service by the FARC. And he's increased substantially the funding for his military and police. The administration's drug control policy in Colombia is now built on a firm foundation of political will. Any progress in Colombia comes because the Colombian people will it, because their leaders have the courage to risk their lives, and because the U.S. Congress has embraced this worthy clause. And we thank you for that, sir, over the years. We are thankful for the bipartisan support of Congress in our efforts to protect our communities from drugs by giving the Colombian people many of the tools they will need to take their country back from the narco-terrorists. 
President Bush has assured President Uribe of our support in helping defeat these narco terrorists. And we are hoping this is really a beginning of a new day in Colombia. However, we can't take our eyes off the fact that the U.S. has a serious polydrug problem involving marijuana, synthetic drugs, principally methamphetamine and ecstasy, and cocaine and especially heroin, the last two which come for us from Colombia. We are under attack by international criminal organizations that traffic in drugs, arms, and people. Cain, cocaine still continues to be a serious problem, and there's no doubt that heroin is particularly visible in the, many of the eastern cities. We want to reduce drug use in this country. Our objective in supply reduction is to cause one or more elements vital for drug production to collapse and structurally damage the entire drug industry. We need to treat drugs as a commodity, increase the cost of doing business by targeting its vulnerabilities in the marketplace, its transportation net, and its profit base. With regard to heroin, we, we have, have to look at the entire gamut of the industry and how it operates worldwide, what actions are necessary to break it, and what actions have historically had little or no measurable impact. Our national drug control strategy employs a variety of tactics, such as interdictional, organizational attack, alternative development, intelligence collection and sharing, in addition to aerial eradication, which we are continuing. We have not been able, though, to adequately assess how effective the aerial eradication on heroin flow to the U.S. has been. It does, however, exact a high opportunity cost uh, in that it uses up a substantial amount of eradication resources. The, the nature of the poppy plant and operational difficulties posed by the mountainous regions of Colombia where the poppy is grown suggests that we are continuing study of this issue. Another important consideration in Colombia is that the cocaine industry supplies a very large amount of the income that supplies the terrorist organizations. We need to support Colombia's strong anti-coca campaign and not let it fail if we have to redirect assets. It is coca and the large amount of money that keeps the illegal armies in the field and denies security to Colombia. We have employed in Colombia promising alternative strategies against heroin that can produce good or excellent results and build on our present efforts. We've attacked the movement of heroin through airport inspections and using many new technologies and also expanded substantially the law enforcement activities. We will continue to track our efforts, assess the effectiveness of this strategy, and we'll update Congress on our progress. I want to thank you again for this opportunity and for your steadfast support in this important struggle and for your part in the success of the current campaign being waged by President Uribe and the United States. We must all continue to back President Bush's commitment to support President Uribe and the brave people of Colombia. Thank you, sir. Our next witness is Mr. Simons from the State Department. And uh, we're going to ask Mr. Simons if he would uh, proceed with his testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to meet with you today uh, to discuss U.S. heroin strategy in Colombia. I'd also like to associate myself with the uh, congratulations that uh, Mr. Crane offered for uh, Mr. Gilman for your longstanding support uh, for our Columbia programs and our counter-narcotics objectives in Columbia. Thank you. Let me note that Mr. Simons is acting Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, I also plan to deliver a short oral statement and would ask that uh, my longer writ written statement be entered into the record. Without objection, we appreciate your brevity. U.S. counter-narcotics programs in Colombia represent a response to one of the most important challenges we confront today. The issues raised by Colombia's production and U.S. importation of illicit drugs directly affect the well-being of U.S. citizens, the survival of a democratic Colombia, the stability of the Andean region, as it relates to fighting the twin menaces of the illegal drug industry and terrorism. For Colombia, confronting the intertwined dangers of counter-narcotics and drug-supported terrorism is a vital element in President Uribe's broader initiative to reinforce the rule of law, build a healthier and stable economy, and instill a greater respect for human rights. Mr. Chairman, attacking the heroin production problem in Colombia is an important U.S. counter-drug priority. Opium poppy cultivation in Colombia now totals approximately 6,500 uh, hectares uh, and generates a potential 4.3 metric tons of heroin, nearly all of this destined for the U.S. market. This could represent up to as much as one-third of the estimated 13 to 18 metric tons of heroin consumed annually in the U.S. Our fight against heroin and other hard drugs is a coordinated, multifaceted campaign 
uh, again, as Mr. Crane has indicated, that includes interdiction elements, eradication elements, alternative development elements, as well as law enforcement elements. State Department resources provided through INL are supporting all four elements of this strategy in cooperation with our 28-year program of partnership with the Colombian police. In the interdiction area, our financial and technical assistance to Colombia during the last few years under Plan Colombia is increasing the government of Colombia's capability to interdict heroin in its production and distribution phases. In fiscal year 02, we directly budgeted $26 million in INL resources to the Colombian National Police specifically for interdiction activities. And we also funded over $84 million in CNP aviation and construction programs that supported their ability to conduct interdiction operations. In addition, the sizable portion of the $104 million uh, that was provided in our resources for Colombian military counter-drug counter programs was also directed towards uh, interdiction. INL is also financially supporting DEA's airport interdiction project, which intends to detect and capture hard drugs and traffickers using air transport. And for that purpose, we've dedicated $1.5 million in FY02 and a proposed $1.75 million in FY03 funding. Reflecting the importance of this interdiction activity, Colombia has seized more than 670 kilograms of heroin and morphine in 2002, which is a significant portion of total pro potential production. With respect to aerial eradication, we are currently engaged in the second and most aggressive phase of this year's poppy spraying program, utilizing four T-65 spray aircraft in the southwestern part of the country. To date this year, we have sprayed approximately 3,200 hectares of poppy, and we hope to reach the goal of spraying 5,000 hectares, which is our goal, by year end. We recognize, Mr. Chairman, that the spray figures from 2001 were considerably lower than 2,000's total of 8,800 hectares. This was due uh, to a number of different factors. Uh, slow delivery of the spray planes that were ordered under Plan Colombia, uh, inability of security aircraft, uh, shortages of pilots, uh, some interruptions in the budget, uh, and bad weather. Uh, but most importantly, in the first year of Plan Colombia, both the U.S. government and the Colombian government did assign a priority to the attack against COCA in fiscal year 2001. This year, I am pleased to report that with the support of Congress and considerable effort and work on the part of both the Colombian police as well as U.S. government officials from different agencies, we have significantly increased our capability uh, to spray. We now have a spray plane fleet which is capable of carrying out serious eradication programs for both coca as well as opium poppy. And we hope to see evidence of that both in the O2 numbers as well as in what we can do next year. Of special note is the addition of three additional air tractor AT802 spray planes in our fleet this year and the upcoming delivery of another five air tractors in the first half of next year. These aircraft, which have a greater load capacity, can effectively be deployed for either coca or opium spray operation. Initially, we plan to use the air tractors for coca spraying, but this will have the important fact of freeing up the traditional T-65 aircraft, of which we should have six by the middle of next year, for a dedicated effort to poppy spraying. We also have sufficient helicopters for reconnaissance and security to, spray, to support our spray missions, as well as to use these helicopters for interdiction and air support. Until this year, and Mr. Chairman, this has largely to do with the natural lags in the delivery of the Plan Columbia equipment, uh, 
We did not have sufficient assets uh, to carry out both programs uh, to the degree uh, that we would have wanted. We've also made a major effort this year to enhance the training of pilots uh, who could spray in the high altitude poppy environment that we find in Colombia. We have already trained nine pilots specifically under New, New Mexico conditions to operate the air tractors in poppy type environments. An additional six pilots should be trained in the first half of 2003. This means that by the middle of 2003, a complete contingent of 16 uh, mountain trained air tractor pilots uh, will be ready in time to match the incremental delivery of, the, of this equipment uh, to Columbia. So for, for 2002, we plan to achieve our goal of 5,000 uh, hectares of opium poppy spraying. For 2003, our goal is to spray all remaining Colombian poppy up to 10,000 hectares, along with the remaining Colombian coca, which may total as much as 200,000 hectares. I would also like to remind the committee that full funding of our fiscal year 2003 request for Colombia will be essential in order for us to achieve these goals. Finally, let me say one word about alternative development in Colombia. Alternative development is an important pillar of our strategy uh, to counter the drug trade in Colombia. And not only in the coca areas, but also in the poppy areas, uh, USAID is undertaking uh, major efforts in alternative development, which are detailed in my statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next witness is uh, Roger Guevara, Chief of Operations of DEA. Mr. Guevara, you may proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of this committee, I'm very pleased to be here before you today. Before I begin, I would like to thank you and the committee on behalf of uh, Administrator Hutchinson and the men and women of DEA for your continued support of both our international and domestic efforts to combat heroin and other drug trafficking organizations. And please convey to Mr. Hutchinson that we regret that he's soon to leave our battlefield to go on to a bigger battlefield. And we hope we're going to have a good uh, uh, re uh, uh, alternative uh, chairman and replacement. Uh, so please wish him well in his new endeavors. I'll please say, proceed. I'll convey your uh, good wishes, sir. High purity, low price Colombian heroin today dominates the heroin market in the eastern United States. Although abuse of cocaine and marijuana are far more prevalent than heroin, its highly addictive nature Increased potency and availability make it one of the more significant challenges we face. The increased availability of Colombian heroin over the last decade has le led to higher levels of heroin use nationwide. The number of heroin users in the United States has increased substantially, from an estimated hardcore heroin user population of 630,000 in 1992 to almost 1 million regular users today. This country has an additional half million occasional heroin users. Today, they consume 13 to 18 metric tons of heroin each year. Between 1996 and 1999, heroin was the third most frequently reported drug in emergency department visits, and the second behind cocaine, involved in drug-related deaths. According to the 2001 National Household Survey on Drug Abuse, more than three million Americans aged 12 or older had tried heroin at least once. These statistics place heroin among the top three drugs of abuse in the country. In the 1980s and 1990s, Southeast and Southwest Asian traffickers dominated the heroin trade. The majority of heroin entering the market originated in Burma and Afghanistan. Today, Colombian traffickers have effectively seized control of the East Coast market. In 2001, under DEA's heroin signature program, Approximately 56% of the heroin seized in the United States by federal authorities and analyzed by DEA was Colombian, as opposed to a combined 14% from Asia and 30% from Mexico. Although these results should not be equated with market share, they are good indicators of relative availability over time. Independent trafficking groups who operate outside the control of the major cocaine organizations dominate the Colombian drug trade. In the early 1990s, the bulk of the South American heroin smuggled into the United States 
was transported by couriers on direct commercial flights from Colombia to the United States. Since the mid-1990s, Colombian heroin traffickers have diversified their methods of operation, smuggling heroin into the United States through countries in South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, and seek, sending bulk shipments of heroin to the United States using cargo planes, container ships, and go-fast vessels. Seizures of 15 to 30 kilograms of heroin are now common, and seizures of up to 50 kilograms of heroin occur, but less frequently. Uncorroborated DEA intelligence has implicated Colombia's terrorist organizations, the FARC, ELN, and AUC, in the Colombian heroin trade. Specifically, these groups are suspected of charging a tax fee uh, from heroin traffickers who obtain heroin from areas under their control. These groups are also suspected of taxing farmers who cultivate poppy plants in areas they control. While on the subject of terrorist organizations involved in the Colombian heroin trade, I would like to repeat something Administrator Hutchinson has stated repeatedly, namely that the fight against international drug trafficking organizations is a crucial element in conducting the war on terror and one we are committed to fighting. With the full backing of the administration and support of Congress, DEA and the Colombian National Police have created a heroin task force to coordinate Colombian heroin investigations. At full strength, the task force will be comprised of 40 officers in five locations throughout Colombia. To assist with this effort, DEA has dedicated additional manpower resources to Colombia. Effective multinational enforcement initiatives led by DEA have already resulted in significant seizures of heroin outside of the U.S. borders. Since 1997, heroin seizures have increased by 1,100 percent in Venezuela, 1,000 in Ecuador, 500 percent in Panama, and 300 percent in Colombia. The regional enforcement initiative, known as Operation Plataforma, was launched in April 2001 and resulted in the seizure of 144 kilograms of heroin and the arrest of 85 defendants in Colombia, Chile, Peru, Venezuela, and Ecuador. Based on this success, participating countries have continued the operation on a permanent basis. DEA and the CNP initiated Operation Matador to target a heroin trafficking organization responsible for transporting multi-kilogram quantities of heroin from Bogota to the United States. The organization utilized couriers to transport heroin overland from Bogota to border towns located in Venezuela and Ecuador, and then shipped the heroin in commercial planes to Mexico City, Mexico, and subsequently to McAllen, Texas. In November of 2001, this investigation was concluded with the arrest of 26 key members of this organization and the seizure of 38 kilograms of heroin. Additionally, DEA offices in Texas, New York, New Jersey, and Rhode Island arrested 28 defendants and seized an additional 38 kilograms of heroin. The United States, Colombia, and the Andean region countries face dramatic new challenges in combating heroin trafficking groups. DEA will continue to invest considerable time and resources in the close partnership we have developed with our counterparts in the region. I thank the committee again for this opportunity to, to appear before you today, and we'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Guevara. Uh, Mr. Uh, Simons, allow me to address some questions to you. Um, you mentioned that uh, you're going to be able to eliminate 5,000 by the end of this year, 5,000 hectares of opium? Is that correct? Our goal for this year is 5,000. Currently, we're at about 3,200. So Mr. how Chairman. are you going to do it in just a few remaining days? We don't have too many days yet left, but we are uh, going to see as how close we can get to the 5,000 figure. How the close time. do you expect to get to it? Realistically, without putting figures I think we'll get as close as we can, Mr. Chairman. Well, that's uh, an obvious answer. Um, I note that in the year 2000, uh, under General Serrano, uh, some uh, 9,200 hectares uh, were eliminated in nine-month period. And then in the year 2001, only 1,800 hectares of opium were eradicated. And now we're only up to 3,000 total of 4,800 hectares in a two-year period, 2001 and 2002. How do you account for that reduction in 
this important crop that's affecting our whole nation? The next question mm -hmm. is following up. Mr. Chairman, I think the, the main intervening event uh, during that period was the passage of the Plan Colombia supplemental funding in the middle of the year 2000 and the major shift uh, that took place that time in which the government of Colombia, uh, supported by our government, uh, devoted substantial energies to spraying coca during the year 2001 at a time in which the new spray aircraft that were funded, uh, were being funded under uh, Plan Colombia had not yet arrived. So if you look at the total spray figures uh, for the year 2001, we actually were able to boost uh, the coca spraying from about uh, 53,000 hectares up to 94,000. Well, so well, clearly well, there was a major well, well, focus. Well, let me interrupt you. What was the boost? It was about uh, 40,000 uh, hectares in the coca side. No, but clearly when, there was a major focus. What, what happened to the opium side? Well, the opium side obviously went down. Why? Uh, That's, we want to know why it went down. Well, Is it true that Ambassador Patterson notified our committee that in January 2001 she decided to stop spraying opium in order to pursue an historic opportunity to spray a record number of hectares of coca? Is that a, an accurate statement? My understanding, Mr. Chairman, is that the decision for the year 2001, the recommendation on part of both the Colombians, which was supported by the U.S., was to focus our energies on coca. And for that reason, there was a well, major who increase may, in who the may, coca spray. Who made that decision? I believe that was a decision uh, in which the Colombian officials, uh, in consultation uh, with U.S. officials, uh, were involved. Is Ambassador Patterson here? I see that she is. Ambassador Patterson, would you come up to the, pan the desk, please? Ambassador Patterson, did you make that decision back in uh, January of 2001 to stop spraying opium? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me first well, say that. We welcome you. Thank yes, you for thank coming. You. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, as, uh, as my colleague from the State Department, as Paul has said, that was a joint decision, but certainly it was a decision that we made. Yes, sir. And was that directed by state in Washington? Uh, frankly, I can't recall, but there was uh, uh, vast support within the Colombian government and within the State Department, and I believe other agencies in the U.S. government, to focus all our resources on coca eradication. So there was no, no objection to stop opium eradication in Colombia back in January 2001. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we continued opium uh, poppy eradication um, periodically throughout the year, and we're certainly trying to recover now. But we did have a history, and we were very successful in coca eradication. Yeah, we and took I, I don't question that. But what of I'm concerned about, what we're concerned about in this committee, that only 1,800 hectares of opium were eradicated in the year 2001. It dropped from 9,200 in the prior year, and it resulted in a massive increase of uh, uh, export of uh, uh, opium to the United States. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we were also facing a cri crisis in coca. It was flooding cheap coca. It was increasing at a rate of something like 20 and 30 percent a year. But Madam Ambassador, 90s. isn't most of the coca production going to the European continent and the, the vast majority of the illicit drugs coming from Colombia are uh, opium drugs at the present time. Our estimate, sir, is somewhere between half and third of the, of the cocoa cultivation, cocoa crop goes to Europe, but still a good half of it comes here. But we have about 60 percent of the opium crop coming to the United States, do we not? Yes, sir. In light of what we heard from the local police this morning and the fact that ONDCP itself reports that heroin is the most addictive drug by nearly twice that of cocaine, um, was, Mr. Simons, I'm asking you, was this decision to stop spraying opium uh, a, an appropriate decision? Mr. Chairman, I, I think it's inappropriate uh, to refer to a decision to stop 
spraying opium. Uh, as the ambassador has indicated, the, fo the greater focus was placed on coca spraying. There was still spraying of opium that went on but uh, it was during the year. it was minor and intermittent compared to what had been done previously isn't that correct certainly there was a certainly there was a decline but as i pointed out in a, my a, testimony a major decline 1800 hectares in 2001 compared to 9200 hectares in the year 2000 that's correct 75 percent reduction that's correct, but we are making that, we are beginning to make that up, and we should make major inroads well, you've, uh, you've next only, year. You've only made it up to 3,000 this year. It's still a, a 60, a uh, one third of what was done in the year 2000. And, and That's you correct. heard you heard the local police expressing their concern of the widespread opium addiction problem in our country. Something's wrong at the top here in your strategy. That's correct, Mr. Chairman, but once again, if I could refer back to the observation I made before, which was we were able to achieve a very substantial increase in coca eradication. This year, yeah, but we'll be achieving I'm, up but, to 130,000 yeah, uh, hectares. Allow me to interrupt you. We're not concerned right now about the coca crop, which most of it is going to Europe. We're concerned about this vast supply of heroin that's coming to our country, and yet you're not doing enough to meet the prior 2,000 uh, uh, volume of 9,200 hectares that were sprayed, only because you stopped eradicating. Uh, Mr. And Chairman, I don't I understand that rationale, and I'd like you to explain that. I think the issue here is a, it was a resource constraint. We had additional spray planes coming on board, but they had not arrived. But, At the but same Mr. time, there was a, a political... Mr. Uh, Simons, General Serrano had the same amount of aircraft. He sprayed 9,200 hectares with that amount of aircraft. So that's not an excuse that's ra ra rationally correct. We've heard all kinds of excuses uh, from the state, like bad weather, lack of spray planes, the crop is hard to find, and it goes on and on why opium eradication fell off. But the C Colombian police, in less than three quarters of a year in the year 2000, nearly eliminated 80, 90 percent of the opium crop. So these excuses are hollow uh, to our ears. And what we want to know is what you're doing now to eliminate the crop. We were told that in two or three months that crop could be eliminated completely if properly addressed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just go back with respect to the year 2000 uh, and note that uh, we were able to spray with the Colombians uh, 53,000 hectares of coca that year in addition you keep to the 8,000. going 8, back to the coca crop. I'm right. talking well, now about our crisis in, in opium Well, production. there were difficult trade-offs to be made, Mr. Chairman. It was a very but difficult why, trade-off. Why did we make that trade-off when we have such a problem with opium uh, confronting our country? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would just go back to your opening statement with which I agreed, which is that we ought to be able to, I, th I believe you said, uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. I believe in the year 2003, when the equipment uh, that you provided uh, under the supplemental is made available, we will be able to accomplish both of our objectives. Well, you've had good equipment in the year 2002, and you've only gone 3,000 hectares of opium spraying. Seems to me there's a lot lacking here. And I hope you would take another look at all of this. And uh, it wasn't Ambassador Patterson uh, who had to make that initiative. That came out of Washington. And uh, I think you've made some wrong decisions. And you heard the local police today. They don't know what to do with this major uh, flowing uh, uh, of heroin that's coming out of Colombia. I hope you're going to take another look at the direction in which you're going. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Guevara, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Uh, no, sir. I've uh, already indicated the uh, the level of the uh, problem that the as the EA sees it. And, uh, would, uh, uh, so we can uh, doing on the do more side. with the resources that we have. Uh, we must continue to uh, keep up the good fight. And if we had better eradication, I assume your fight would be eased quite a bit. Well, I could not certainly dispute that. If uh, if we can attack it at the source, I think uh, that we're all in agreement that that is where we could have the uh, biggest impact. Was your agency can, uh, uh, conferred 
with, with regard to cessation of opium eradication at the time they beefed up the uh, coca eradication? Well, Were sir, you consulted? Sir, uh, I, I can't answer that specifically, but I can assure you that the, uh, the DEA uh, in country in Bogota who report to the ambassador uh, certainly are in day-to-day -day coordination on all matters with regard to, uh, to the drug issue in, in Colombia. Oh, I'm asking was DEA here in Washington consulted with regard to the change in policy of concentrating on coca eradication as compared to opium eradication? Do you know whether they... I, I do not know the answer to that. I may cer I'll may certainly look into it and see whether my predecessor had such conversations. I would appreciate if you could uh, advise this committee uh, in writing after you've consulted with your people whether DEA was consulted. Mr. Crane, do you have any comments? Uh, no, sir. What we have to find it in an effective way. However, I look at this, this problem as a large problem. Where, where, wherever the heroin's coming from, we have to stop it. And um, you're in charge of supply reduction. Yes, sir. Were you consulted with a change of attitude about eradicating coca as compared to eradicating heroin? My view that I should get back to you since I've been there, what, six months and, and check the record. Would you do that and notify us in writing whether Absolutely. you were consulted? Thank you. And I'm about to turn the chair over to Mr. Micah, who's been an outstanding uh, warrior in our war against drugs, and I regret that I have to go on to another meeting. And I thank our panelists for being here and welcome uh, Ambassador Patterson. We appreciate your hospitality when we were there not too long ago. Mr. Micah. I thank uh, our panelists again for their cooperation today and uh, thank uh, Mr. Gilman for his uh, untiring uh, efforts uh, to deal with this uh, narcotics uh, problem. I think when I was a staffer back in the Senate early 80s uh, starting on the problem, he had already uh, provided leadership in the Congress on the issue and we're going to miss his efforts. Uh, he certainly has been one of the warriors to uh, address uh, this uh, very serious problem, and I think you all uh, join me in wishing him well. Uh, we'll miss him both on the committee uh, and in Congress. Uh, um, the testimony today has, uh, has provided us uh, an update on, uh, again, a very serious problem, and that's the availability of um, heroin and very deadly heroin coming in in unprecedented amounts uh, from Colombia. We know the source, and we have the signature programs that identify exactly where this uh, stuff is coming from, and unfortunately, its uh, uh, effects. We've also heard the testimony uh, in regard to uh, the deaths and destruction of lives and addiction uh, it's causing. Uh, there is some conflict in some of the testimony we've heard today, and I have a copy of um, uh, estimation of uh, heroin availability, 1996 to 2000, which was uh, published by the Executive Office of the President, Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, let me state uh, uh, and quote from that report. It says, an analysis of retail heroin signature data indicates that South American heroin dominates the U.S. heroin market, particularly in the eastern United States, accounting for more than 67 uh, percent of the heroin consumed in the United States. And uh, we also have a copy of the official country handbook on Colombia, uh, put out by the Department of Defense dated October. 2001, and it states on page 60 that 65 percent of the heroin found in the United States of Colombian uh, origin um, 
Are these uh, figures uh, correct, uh, Mr. Crane? Uh, uh, Mr. The Sun? OECP did uh, put the study out making the assumption that the, uh, the signature program gave the balance. However, subsequent to that, the drug enforcement did a very detailed study, and, we've, and there's been a reevaluation of that the official estimate now is quite a bit less. So when that study was published, it was based on assuming that the signature data gave the... the Can you turn the mic Oh, on? I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought it was on. The, let, let me begin again. Uh, when that study was published, the assumption under, underlying it was that the signature data gave an adequate uh, estimate of the, pro of the production percentages. Uh, uh, however, subsequent research later, including looking at where, you know, where the fields are, and uh, the new breakthrough analysis by the Drug Enforcement suggested that that, that was an error. So the, the most recent studies, um, official estimates uh, that we have put in the, are the current ones of about four metric tons available based on uh, the amount of fields under production. And they also looked in some detail how many harvests and so on. So uh, the newer data it would be, is accurate, and th these studies are outdated by newer research. Who does the uh, signature program? Is that you, Mr. Rivera. That is a uh, study that's uh, led by DEA and it's conduct, uh, conducted uh, in concert with other government agencies. And well, that study has, in fact, been conducted and uh, we identify as Operation well, Breakthrough. Uh, we've been told by, uh, our staff has been told that there's a different figure here that is only about a third of uh, heroin production coming uh, out of uh, Colombia. And you've just heard Mr. Crane say that uh, that number, the, the numbers in these uh, documents is, uh, is, and uh, the documents I quoted uh, are incorrect. What, what do you find? One of the results of the study was that the, uh, the opium poppy uh, fields were actually only capable of producing two times a year versus the uh, previous uh, belief that it was uh, three and four times a year. Well, this is... This is information given uh, uh, to our congressional uh, staff and members in October, and it says 65 percent of the heroin in the U.S. is from Colombia. Um, I'm not sure if this has a date on it. Uh, it's given in October 15. But it's given in, in October, but what uh, date do you know uh, uh, that, that would hold true, or was, is that information incorrect also? Uh, I, I would have to uh, consider what date specifically we're looking at. Uh, our best information well, certainly... what's the latest signature evidence? And signature should be pretty accurate because it's taken from, I guess, a chemical DNA analysis. And you, uh, I've been told you could, you could pinpoint it practically to the fields where the, uh, where the stuff is being produced. What's the la latest data that uh, DEA has uh, produced on the... Uh, Percentage coming from Colombia. Uh, I do not have that at uh, uh, at my fingertips at the moment. But the uh, again, the, uh, the the study indicates that uh, that uh, well, everything we have from these reports uh, uh, have an executive summary. The information provided to staff and members as recently as October, just a month or two ago. Uh, indicates uh, a higher percentage than we're hearing testimony today. Is there something uh, we're missing? Uh, I, I, uh, I understand, sir, that the, uh, that the heroin signature uh, program uh, from DEA uh, uh, has uh, What's looked at that issue and, and considers 56 percent to be the... Uh, what was the time of that analysis? I, I believe this to be the most current uh, estimate. Would that be... 2000, 2002. 2002, the latest information you have. That's correct. So that's a little bit different than a third uh, that you've heard uh, Mr. Crane and uh, others uh, testify to or comment uh, on today. Uh, the, I, I can only go by uh, the best estimates, and, and I believe that to be 56 percent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Uh, one of the disturbing things I found in the uh, analysis, and I've been following this for a while, is uh, in, you, you said uh, in the 50, 56? Well, if I may be allowed to percent. consult uh, this question f for clarification, please.
Well, signature analysis would give us uh, very uh, specific uh, data as to that, uh, which that's based on seizures and where that uh, uh, where that uh, drug is coming from. Do we have? Uh, Want to try to proceed with the hearing? All the hearing come to the United States. <coughs> Mr. Gravera. Yeah. Sir, uh, as, as I understand it, uh, of all the uh, seizures made that DEA has analyzed. Uh, as of what date? As of 2002. 56 percent of all the heroin uh, that was uh, analyzed by the uh, DEA under the hit heroin signature program, uh, of that amount, 56 percent of it was Colombian. Okay. And that's what I have from, from previous documents provided uh, by DEA. Um, the difference, uh, one of the differences I see is an increase in uh, Mexican uh, heroin production uh, and also identification of Mexican heroin that's seized in the United States, and that's up to 30 percent? That, that was correct. Okay. Well, and, uh, well, again, Mr. Simon, Mr. Crane, these figures do, do differ f and from, from what you provided us today in testimony and also what you're indicating. Now, maybe you know something that we don't know about a trend that's taking place right now. Uh, I'd certainly like to know about that. Uh, what, how's, what's your explanation of the difference, Mr. Crane? The, the official estimates of, of supply come from surveillance of the fields in both Mexico and Colombia, and uh, that's done through intelligence means. Uh, then, so that's how we make the estimate, how many fields there are. And then, then, then there's also a study of how many times they're harvested and, and how much, uh, what is the yield of opium to heroin. But the actual... Right. That's how the, the official estimates are made. The that are reaching the United States, we know pretty definitely from this DEA analysis where they came from. That's correct. Uh, let me comment. The signature data is, is if the, if, for example, is based on seizures, and we, you know, there are a lot of seizure increases after 9-11 because we've increased security. But the seizures don't necessarily represent an, an unbiased sample of, of the country. So what they would provide basically is uh, an, an estimate of, of, you know, what transportation modes they were seized off and so on. So they don't necessarily represent a, a production estimate. Um, the one thing about, uh, is, is best I understand when, when I came to the job and I looked at this, is uh, the signature program uh, can tell you the chemical process used to produce it. So, for example, if Mexican heroin was processed with a Colombian process, we would identify it as South American. So it depends on the type of process. So anyway, that's the best of my understanding at this time uh, and why there's some th of these differences. Well, whether we have the differences or not, uh, we're seeing dramatic increases in, <clears throat> in heroin. We're seeing a dramatic reduction in the eradication program. I mean, uh, you've, uh, everyone's testified to that. Um, our job is to r react to what's taking place. and. Uh, we have the equivalent of, um, of six uh, September 11th every day, uh, I'm sorry, every year in the United States uh, uh, now on an annual basis uh, taking place with drug overdose deaths and many of them attributed to increase in, in heroin activity. And somehow, uh, and you all represent the leadership, at least in the administration, uh, on these issues. Somehow we've got to have the policy uh, respond to the threat. And obviously it isn't doing it, whether it's under our, uh, and, and it's now unfortunately under our watch uh, with this, this new administration. So um, the next question would be, we, we've identified that there is a problem. Everyone identifies that heroin is uh, on the increase. Everyone agrees that the the eradication program has uh, fallen short, uh, and maybe it was to address uh, coca, but we've got that problem now and we need a balance uh, approach. One of the things that's been mentioned here is, um, and a, uh, is a lack of uh, resources to go after uh, both coca and uh, heroin. Uh, 
poppy production. Uh, I'm also told it's going to be the middle of 2003 to shift. Uh, is that as as now? I think 2003 it was indicated to uh, take that long to train additional pilots, and that's to have your maximum capacity to do the job. Uh, in the meantime, is there some reshifting of sources to increase the eradication uh, um, of the poppy uh, heroin uh, problem, Mr. Simmons? Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as I indicated in my opening statement, uh, our goal is to spray the entire Colombian opium poppy crop during calendar 2003 up to 10,000 hectares. Mm -hmm. We have not yet received the uh, analysis, uh, as Mr. Crane pointed out, uh, from the intelligence community, which will give us some idea as to the size of that crop. We should receive that in the next couple of months. We're all the but fun. once we receive that, we will map out with the Colombian National Police a game plan which will cover calendar uh, 2003, which will look at our goal of spraying the entire poppy crop as well as the entire coca crop. Okay. Now, were all the funds ex that were to be expended on eradication through 2000 uh, to uh, through the, the end of the fiscal, the past fiscal year expended uh, and expended on the eradication program? We have obligated all our fiscal year 2002 funding that was devoted to the eradication program, yes. Well, okay. Some of that will carry over. Okay. Uh, my question, let's go back. Um, you've obligated. So what, how much is uh, the obligation as a carryover from 2002 fiscal year that ended end of September? We, at the very end of 2002, there were various holds placed on our eradication monies during fiscal year 2002. Who so placed, we actually did not have the availability of those funds. And who placed the holds? Uh, by uh, uh, the Senate side. So we did not actually obtain release of those funds uh, until, until the very end of the fiscal year. So we are right now working. And when was that? I'm sorry? When was that? Uh, the last August week of September. Last week of September. Correct. And how much money was held by the Senate? $17 million, Mr. Chairman. What percentage of that was your total pl uh, plan? That was the Support entire budget for the chemicals that were used in the program. So you had no money for chemicals. We are now utilizing the fiscal year 2002 monies for the chemical program, but we don't have our budget yet for fiscal year 2003. We're operating off a continuing resolution. Uh, all right, so $17 million, and you, and you carefully uh, term uh, in your testimony, uh, you said that uh, you obligated, and that's all obligated, and that's, that's all for chemicals. That's correct. And if you have the chemicals, what about the uh, aircraft uh, uh, and other operational uh, spare parts and things that are needed? Well, we're still working off some 2002 monies, but uh, we will is, need. Okay, wait. Let's, I don't. I, I can get back record. to you on the specific numbers on that. What percentage? Fifty percent. Of what we need for 2000 uh, was part of that held up to. No, no, it was not. Just the chemicals. Okay, and well, again, I'm trying to get a picture of where we are, what we haven't done with money that was appropriated, and whether it was. Uh, and some of this may justifiably be, um, well, that's not justifiable, but it may not be your responsibility. What I'm trying to do is pinpoint responsibility, why things didn't get done, and, and where responsibility lies. So um, let's go back to equipment and, uh, and, and tell me what you have left over, spare parts, other things that would take to do the job. And then uh, when you finish with that, I was told it took about a year to do one of the contracts. Um, and, uh, and I want an explanation why it takes so long to contract. I don't have the specific information on the one-year contract. But let's, let's start first with what's left over now in addition to uh, 
the, the uh, chemical uh, fund uh, disbursement delay? Essentially, Mr. Chairman, the resource issue has largely to do with the delivery of the spray aircraft that we obtained under the fiscal year 2000 supplemental for Plan Columbia. Those aircraft are now starting to arrive. Three of the air tractors have arrived this year. We'll, we'll get five more. Okay, that was 2000, and that's, that's the, right. And but that procurement that, took some time. Yes, and that was m part of my question: right. is why that took so long? Well, there are various lead times in terms of. Yeah, I have to get back. Yeah, Mr. Sorry. Chairman, there are various leads times in terms of uh, ordering uh, these aircraft, and also in terms of training the pilots. We needed to train the pilots for the mountain conditions in Colombia. Well, the contract took how long to do uh, for the aircraft? I believe the aircraft, most of the aircraft were available towards the middle of this year. And since then, we've been engaged in pilot training. I'm told that's a separate contract. Uh, the first one for the T-65 aircraft waited so long that the contractor went out of business. Is that the case? Could you repeat the question? Well, that they're talking about two, several contracts here. The T-65 spray aircraft, it took so long for the contract uh, uh, to be processed. During the, that time uh, of the processing, the contractor went out of business, filed for bankruptcy. I don't have that information, Mr. Chairman. I could can you, get it for you. Could you get it for us? Well, again, I mean, this is a uh, like the gang that can't shoot sh straight. Sometimes I wonder if they don't want to shoot in the first place. But uh, it's very frustrating if, from, from our standpoint. And I know that there are impediments placed on you if the Senate puts a hold or somebody puts a hold on this money. Uh, but you can see why we're not getting the, the job done. It's, uh, I would remark, Mr. Chairman, that together with the Colombian police, we will succeed in spraying approximately 130,000 hectares of coca this year, in addition to 94,000 last year. And we hope to meet our goal of 5,000 hectares of poppy this year okay. and up to 10,000 goals of poppy, uh, 10,000 hectares of poppy next year. And these, in and our view, are money. significant achievements. Okay, and you have the money now. Uh, you have the resources as far as the aircraft, because you need aircraft. You have the resources as far as the chemical. You have, the resor uh, you have all the resources to get the job done, some carryover money. Um, you do have some delay now, and you probably should have a resolution in January on the funding, the fiscal year we're in. Does that present a delay uh, factor? No, we should be able to achieve our objectives provided we get full funding uh, in 03. Okay, and that that would be of the of the funds uh, that uh, you're anticipating and that you've seen uh, at least preliminarily uh, designated for uh, let me take that for um, this fiscal year we're currently in, but uh, hasn't been uh, finished. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, The only uh, caveat that I heard in testimony was that it would take another six months to train the pilots uh, to have all air aircraft flying. Is that that's also correct? That's correct. The new air tractors that we'll be getting during the first six months of the next year, it will take that much time to train the pilots. One of the Okay, so there are no impediments. We're having testimony today uh, that uh, we will have the resources to go after both the coca and heroin uh, production. Are there any political uh, impediments either in, on the Colombian side or the U.S. side that you know of that would inhibit moving forward with this uh, eradication program? Ambassador, you want to just... Yeah, Mr. Chairman, yes, uh, there are no political impediments. Uh, actually, the new administration in Colombia has been extremely aggressive. We've in both met uh, with the president. Uh, I've met with him twice. Uh, the speaker has met with him. 
Uh, we're told that he has, uh, well, he's personally committed uh, the will, uh, the resources, the policy uh, to support uh, that effort. What about the United States side? I, I wanted to follow up on my colleague's response, if I could. The, the bottom line is that they would spray even more aggressively if we could provide additional resources. In other words, we can always use extra money. I think we could do more, and perhaps this will be something to discuss with you in 04, if we had additional aircraft and additional helicopters. But they have this current administration in Colombia has an unprecedented degree of political will to prosecute the drug war. Well, I'd rather do it in 03 than uh, 04. So if you could provide us with uh, a request, uh, well, I'm asking for a request for a supplemental uh, to, provide, to be provided to the uh, uh, subcommittee and what it would take uh, to move forward in this fiscal year uh, to uh, complete the job. Uh, the other thing, too, in Plan Columbia, and, you know, we heard, we do hear that this does push, uh, push the product around. Uh, I'm also concerned about uh, the spread of uh, cultivation in Ecuador, and we did provide funds and assistance and a program in Plan Columbia to assist some of these uh, other uh, regional potential future locations as say spreading the cultivation is where are we on that mr. Simon the administration request uh, for 03 for the Andean counter narcotics initiative 731 million dollars is the administration request uh, that's also the house mark and that's the number that we uh, are hoping that we can receive full funding for in order to uh, obtain our objectives. Of that $731 uh, million, $439 million is for Colombia. Uh, the remainder is for the other Andean countries, specifically to address this issue of spillover that you mentioned. Now, the bulk of these funds are for Peru and Bolivia, but there's also a substantial Ecuador. amount for Ecuador uh, for alternative development as well as for support to Ecuadorian law enforcement. The other uh, thing, and again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look at these figures, is uh, Mexico is now becoming uh, one of our top producers. Uh, and uh, every year I get the statistics back, uh, I'm shocked by the increases uh, in drug production in uh, Mexico. Uh, and also percentage of, of Mexican either produced uh, or processed uh, uh, narcotics that is entering the United States, and that's confirmed by your uh, signature analysis. Is that correct, Mr. That is correct. Okay. Uh, that brings up a couple of things: is how we stop the Mexican uh, production. Uh, have we developed any kind of a strategy to deal with this, uh, Mr. Simon? Certainly, we're taking a very close look at Mexico. Uh, for a number of years, uh, our programs in is Mexico that, were that, quite small, uh -huh. uh, but we've recently enjoyed uh, 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 a much improved relationship with uh, Mexican law enforcement across the board. Um, I think DEA may also want to speak to that. So we have the opportunity to now to work more closely with our uh, Mexican counterparts. And uh, most recently, in the FY02 supplemental, uh, we sought and received uh, $25 million in additional funding uh, for Mexico uh, for a border security project on the northern border, uh, which could also have significant uh, impact on the drug trade. So we're certainly taking a look at opportunities to work more closely with Mexican law enforcement. Mr. Guevara, the uh, Mexicans placed a limitation on the number of DEA agents uh, uh, in the past, has that changed? Uh, yes, sir. We have uh, we have made a request of the uh, uh, Mexican government to increase our staffing in Mexico for the express purposes of assigning additional personnel along the uh, the north uh, west border of Mexico. It's my understanding. Have we? Have we? Uh, they did put a cap before. Is that cap been lifted, or do you just have a request pending? It's. I, I believe that the uh, the request has been honored and that, uh, that, that we have uh, received approval to go forward with opening uh, additional DEA offices along the border. 
The uh, the fact what is. What about investigations? Uh, yes, uh, they would be there for. Uh, are uh, you I, are you aware of any uh, Treasury increase in activities in Mexico to um, uh, cooperative efforts to increase our uh, financial investigations? Uh, I could only speak for DEA, and uh, and we see an enhanced. Uh, uh, will and ability uh, as well on the part of uh, what about the issue of uh, allowing our uh, agents to uh, carry uh, weapons and protect themselves that that has also been brought up with the uh, uh, Mexican State Department the SRE and, uh, and and that has not been resolved to my knowledge and, and remains an outstanding issue um, so INL uh, What's INL's recommendation to the President on the certification issue for this uh, uh, coming year? Have you developed a... Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm afraid I can't uh, get into that question here uh, uh, in open session, uh, uh, but we may be able to brief you separately on this. Uh, the President has not yet uh, made his decision. What was your recommendation? Until the President makes his uh, decision, Mr. Chairman, uh, um, I would prefer uh, to handle this uh, separately. All right. And can you provide the subcommittee, uh, if it, you don't want these documents public, uh, with copies of your recommendations um, without objection, that request is so ordered of, the, of your office. And I'd like to try to have that in. Uh, as soon as possible. Um, let me run back to the equipment and resources. Uh, I got sidetracked and didn't ask this question. One of the problems we've had uh, is first getting equipment down there, getting resources, and and then having a balanced uh, program that goes after the threat as it uh, as it developed or recognized, or we see. Uh, its effect in the United States. Uh, we've lost uh, more uh, aircraft in Colombia than I think we lost in the entire uh, Desert Storm operation. What are we doing uh, to protect the assets uh, that we're sending uh, uh, down there? What kind of program is in place? Is INL working on that? Is Defense uh, working on that? Uh, uh, can you report to me, Mr. Simons, on what? Uh, we're doing to protect the assets that we have down there? Well, we have an active safety monitoring program uh, in place that is supervised by the INL Air Wing out of Patrick Air Force Base and appropriate safety standards. Is, uh, is uh, DOD uh, assisting with that? To, I mean, this is a defensive, uh, it's not. I'm not aware if DOD uh, is, in, is engaged who, in this activity. Who is, a, is there a plan or is there so, something that is uh, in place to, to deal with, uh, again, uh, uh, good program to protect well, We have an active air assets. safety program in place. We can provide more details to you or your staff on I, this. I wish you'd uh, do But I would, I would note that it is a very dangerous operating environment uh, mm -hmm. in Colombia. And uh, we have some very courageous uh, Colombian uh, police uh, and Army officials uh, who put themselves at, at considerable risk uh, in the drug war. And the Secretary, uh, Secretary Powell, when he was down in Colombia last week, uh, paid tribute to the Colombian police who died uh, right. in the course of duty. And not only do they face substantial risk, but our contractors who are also out there on the front lines also face uh, substantial risk. Within the, last, within the last year, our spray pilots took more than 180 hits right. from ground fire. So this is, a, well, this is an I'm, issue that we take very seriously, I'm Mr. Chairman. I'm very much aware of that, but it doesn't sound like we have a plan to protect those assets, and it doesn't sound like INL is coordinating with DOD, and there's a greater DOD presence and activity, and we've been protecting uh, we've been tr protecting the national police, and we should be protecting these assets, which were pretty damn expensive and very difficult to get down there. Uh, let me ask you another question about uh, the uh, assets that we have there, helicopters and uh, any other uh, aircraft, uh, either 
participating in spring or any other activities. Uh, as a, are 100 percent of those assets uh, uh, in the air and being utilized, or are some of them, uh, last time I was there, they were being cannibalized and they didn't have parts to fly, uh, and we had uh, a small percentage of the, uh, of the assets uh, to uh, complete these missions uh, incapacitated. What's the status of that? Well, one of our highest goals is to maintain a high operational readiness rate uh, for the aircraft that we support, and we support a large number of aircraft and helicopters uh, in Colombia. Uh, and we've been pretty successful on this. Uh, in fact, our, our contractor, part our, of their- Our assets uh, all- I, I will provide the figures, Mr. Chairman, okay, but I wanted, I wanted to indicate to you that this is a high priority, and it's something that we also measure- Could you provide the, me with the, the I, I can provide them right now, but I, I wanted to okay, indicate well, to you that this is a priority. Them, submit them to the committee. I, I, can, I can give them- And, uh, and the most up-to-date figures you have. Both I have them right now, and I'd like okay. to provide them here in open testimony. Well, uh, the, the Columbia National Police fixed-wing fleet, there are 23 aircraft we support. Their operational readiness rate has been over 75 percent over the last year. The mission readiness rate for the CNP helicopter fleet was in excess of 75 percent uh, over the past year. And the Colombian Army helos, uh, the 71 Colombian Army, Army helos that were provided under Plan Colombia, we've maintained readiness rates of over 80 percent for those. So we think we've actually acquitted ourselves quite well on the issue of operational readiness. And as I mentioned, the premium payments that we made to our contractor are specifically related to their being able to meet the targets on operational readiness. So for INL and INL management, this is a very high priority. Okay. And uh, on the contractor, do you have any percentages of what they're keeping their uh, aircraft up? They are keeping their aircraft at an operational readiness rate also in excess of 80 percent. Okay. Okay. Well, hopefully we're making some progress in that, uh, that regard. You've been provided with some additional back, background you want to provide? Did you have something else you wanted to provide? Nothing no. Else. Okay. All right. Um, one of the... Um, other concerns I have is, uh, well, there's, there's two things that I mentioned in my uh, opening comments and one that we've studied a long time or delayed, and one is the shoot-down policy as it relates to uh, uh, Peru and information uh, providing. I'm, I'm told that already Peru, we're seeing additional trafficking, additional uh, production, uh, lack of ability to uh, respond to uh, Again, the reinstitution of uh, uh, production and trafficking in that area because we haven't been able to uh, make a decision or uh, initiate a policy that will help uh, the countries that want to cooperate to uh, move uh, forward. What, what's the status on that, Mr. Simon? Mr. Chairman, this came up uh, during Secretary Powell's uh, recent visit to Colombia. Uh, certainly one of uh, President Uribe's top priorities is the renewal of the uh, Airbridge uh, denial program uh, in Colombia. And Secretary Powell uh, indicated uh, to President Uribe uh, that we are moving uh, as quickly as we can to get this program back up and running and that we would hope to have it uh, operational early in the next year. Uh, currently, we are in the process of training pilots uh, and crews, uh, Colombian and Peruvian pilots and crews. We are working out a revised series of procedures uh, that are consistent with the new U.S. law. We plan to deploy a team to Colombia, a negotiating team, in the next couple of weeks uh, to begin to review these procedures uh, with the Colombian government. Uh, subsequent to that, Congress uh, enacted a procedure that requires a certification process before we actually bring the decision to the President whereby 
uh, a U.S. team would go down to Columbia and certify that the revised procedures are in place. Once all that is done, we come up here, we consult with Congress, uh, and then the President issues the, term, the determination that can make so the program move forward. So we could actually forward. have that done by April or May if everybody did what they were supposed to, right? Well, I think the, uh, the Secretary indicated to President Uribe uh, that we would try to get this running uh, early next year, and that's, uh, uh, that's what we're trying to hold oh, to. Oh, yeah, very strong support. And I'm going to ask Mr. Souter, the Chairman of the uh, Subcommittee, if he continues or whoever chairs the Subcommittee, to follow up with um, additional hearing or uh, review of that uh, matter. I think it's extremely important. Appreciate uh, your keeping the subcommittee posted. The other uh, matter that I uh, raised uh, was the uh, micro herbicide uh, program. What's the status of that, Mr. S Simon? Ambassador, someone? Uh, my understanding is that it was, uh, it was tested some years back, a couple of years ago, and, and proven to be effective in Colombia. Uh, we have not pursued it uh, with this government, and perhaps we should, uh, Congressman. I think it should be. And, uh, you know, for a little, we found that uh, we can not only s spray this stuff, but we can also deactivate it for some period of time, saving money and lives and then encouraging alternative uh, production. Uh, it's not like you put this crop out and, uh, with a little bit of a herbicide. Uh, uh, I think it has great potential. I wish uh, we could uh, pursue that. Uh, um, and it would do a lot of damage to the potential of this stuff coming back. Uh, we are having, though, very good luck, uh, Mr. Chairman, with glyphosate, which is a very benign herbicide and very widely used. Well, I have no objections to uh, a less benign uh, herbicide. So uh, I think, uh, again, it's something I'd like to see pursued. I know a majority of the subcommittee would, too. Uh, I understand you have to uh, leave at this time. Um, I have some additional questions, but what I'm going to do is uh, actually give them to the staff and let them uh, uh, submit them. So without objection, uh, we'll be providing our witnesses with additional uh, questions and uh, uh, would like you to respond. Uh, we're, without objection, we're going to leave the record open for a period of uh, two weeks, 14 days, uh, so ordered. Uh, so I will, I will excuse uh, the witnesses uh, uh, at this juncture. Thank you again for your cooperation. This isn't this isn't meant to be critical of you. And you all do it. Uh, you all do yeoman's uh, work in this effort. Uh, our job is to look at what's happening, uh, and then try to see if we can correct the problems. Part of the problem, of course, is the Congress. If they put holes on things, or you have conflicting signals given. Uh, but we, we have adopted a, a major plan. We need to execute uh, that plan. We need to make certain that you get the resources to do that and try to move this uh, along. Uh, so we appreciate your cooperation. Um, and also, if you could get back to the subcommittee, uh, we would, uh, we would well, we'll not only be grateful, uh, we won't hold you in contempt. How's that? Uh, thank you all. Uh, have a nice holiday and uh, look forward to working with you in the new Congress. Your thank you, Mr. Micah. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one other uh, panelist, and I'm going to call that panelist uh, forward.
If we could uh, go ahead and proceed. We have one final uh, panel. Um, this uh, third panel consists only of Mr. Adam Isaacson. I think uh, the other witnesses, uh, tentative witness, is not here. He's a senior associate for the Center of International Policy. Mr. Isaacson, you know this is an investigative uh, oversight subcommittee of uh, Congress. If you'd stand and be sworn. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? The uh, record will reflect that the uh, witness answered in the affirmative. Welcome, Mr. Isaacson. And uh, if you have lengthy uh, documentation or statement, uh, you're, you're welcome to <coughs> submit it to the uh, subcommittee, and we'll put it in the entire record. Uh, uh, if not, to uh, recognize you to proceed at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know it's been a long hearing, and I'm going to take that five-minute limit very seriously. I just want to begin by congratulating you and the whole committee for holding a hearing on Columbia's heroin crisis. To my knowledge, this problem hasn't been given such a pri high profile in the House before. We've already seen today that this crisis is severe, and it's getting worse. But I want to caution the committee that simply increasing aerial spraying is not likely to reduce the poppy crop. There are several reasons for this. First, opium poppy is an annual plant. If poppies are sprayed, new ones can be planted and harvested within 120 days. A spray program is going to have to be very nimble in order to catch up with that kind of growth cycle. Second, poppy cultivation is also kind of hard to find. Poppies are grown in high altitude zones along the spine of the Andes in very rugged terrain with lots of cloud cover in plots that are usually an acre or smaller. Poppy is so elusive that since 1999, the State Department hasn't even had a decent estimate of how much is being grown in Colombia. If we can't even tell how much there is, how are we going to be able to eradicate it all? But it gets worse. The highest estimate I've heard lately is about 15,000 hectares, and there's a citation in my written testimony of how much poppy is in, is in Colombia. That sounds like a lot of land. But in fact, if you were to put all those hectares of poppies together, 15,000 hectares, they'd fit into a square only 7.6 miles on a side. That's smaller than the District of Columbia, and it's scattered around the country, a country the size of Texas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma put together. I'm not convinced that spray planes and helicopters are going to be able to keep up with this. Our experience trying to spray coca in Colombia is also instructive. Since 1996, the U.S. and Colombian governments have sprayed herbicides over nearly a million acres of coca growing zones. Yet we've seen the coca cultivation in Colombia in that period triple. And the total amount grown in South America has stayed just about the same. But it gets worse. Colombia has 32 departments or provinces. When large scale coca spraying began in 1996, four of these departments, maybe five of them, had about 1,000 um, hectares of coca or more. At the end of last year, 13 departments of Colombia had that much coca. Despite all of our spraying, coca is spreading like a stain across the map of Colombia. So what do we do then to start reducing drug production in Colombia? The answer is as complicated as the problem itself. We have to do a lot of things at once. We have to spend a lot of money. And only a fraction of this money should go to forcible eradication. We have to recall that in a lot of rural Colombia, there's simply no way to make a legal living. Security, roads, credit, access to markets, they're all missing. When the spray planes come, they take away farmers' illegal way of making a living, but they don't replace it with anything. For arguments in support of alternative development, we don't even have to look any further than classic counterinsurgency doctrine. A basic tenet of counterinsurgency strategy is that arming the security forces isn't enough. Large amounts of development aid are needed to help the government win the people's hearts and minds. But when thousands of families get their crops sprayed and then aren't reached by development aid, which is what's happening now, their opposition to the government hardens. This is counterinsurgency in reverse, and it's good news for the guerrillas. A major increase in alternative development has to be at the center of our strategy to reduce heroin in Colombia. 
Alternative development should be easier to carry out in poppy growing zones and in coca zones for two reasons. First, the guerrillas and paramilitaries aren't as much of a threat because they're not as involved in the poppy trade. The DEA Administrator Asa Hutchinson told the Senate um, in Narcotic Caucus in September, our indication is that the terrorist organizations are principally engaged in the cocaine trafficking. There are other criminal organizations in Colombia that are heavily engaged in heroin, but thus far we're not seeing significant terrorist involvement in the her heroin side. So security shouldn't be as much of a threat. Second, there's already an obvious alternative crop. Coffee grows best at the same altitudes as heroin poppy. Yes, coffee prices are at historic lows, and in fact, some coffee growers are turning to poppies in Colombia. But the U.S. Congress has already shown that it wants to help. Last month, the House passed a bipartisan resolution calling on the United States to adopt a global strategy to respond to the coffee crisis with coordinated activities in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Alternative development in poppy growing areas must be part of that strategy. Beyond alternative development, we must never forget that Colombia's status quo, its crisis of drugs and violence, benefits some very powerful people who are getting away with their lawbreaking. We've got to do more to go, we've got to go beyond spraying peasants and jailing addicts. We have to do more to stop the traffickers who've set up international networks. We have to stop the corrupt government officials who allow drugs to pass through. We have to stop the bankers who are laundering the money. Too many of them are still getting away with it. Finally, we have to keep increasing funding to treat addicts here at home. It, it, it's been discussed a lot, and it's true. Remember the 1994 Rand Corporation study that asked, how much would the government have to spend to decrease cocaine consumption in the U.S. by 1%? Rand found that a dollar spent on treatment is as effective as $23 spent on crop eradication. Just to sum up, we all agree that Colombia's heroin crisis has reached frightening proportions. The way out, though, is going to be complicated, expensive, and sometimes frustrating. I ask the committee not to place all of its eggs in the basket of spraying and aid to Columbia's security forces. We're going to need a much fuller mix of strategies if we're going to solve this. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Isaacson. Just a couple of quick questions. Sure. Uh, one, uh, I think you pointed out one of the problems of uh, just spraying for uh, eradication of the poppy crop or uh, uh, coca crop. Uh, that was the, why I asked the question of Ambassador Patterson and the uh, other witnesses about uh, microherbicides. Uh, they do provide a long-term eradication. Are you familiar with their use? I'm familiar with their use, and I haven't seen any tests showing. Um, we, we have tests that show that it will eradicate some of these uh, crops uh, uh, for substantial periods of time. So. I guess, based on your testimony, you would be supportive of something that would take the crop out for a long time. Well, uh, microherbicides, to be honest, make me nervous because we don't know what their impact will be on, on this Amazon ecosystem. We're talking about um, the second largest biodiversity of any country in the world. And, but you also said the area that would be, that's in production is less than the size of uh, the District of Columbia. Scattered around an area more or less the size of California, unfortunately, if you look so at the Andean Ridge. So it wouldn't do much damage since it's uh, spread over such a lo uh, large uh, area. And if the evidence showed that the microherbicide only affected that individual plant you were trying to eradicate, you'd certainly be supportive, wouldn't you? Um, I would be supportive of something that got rid of coca, but also strengthened the Colombian government mm. and provided an alternative to the people who had nothing and left to do. If you were devising Plan Colombia to, uh, uh, to deal with, first of all, you said one of the things we had to do was provide uh, Colombia with security. That was one of the problems that we have is mm -hmm. if you have security, you can probably deal with some of this production and illegal trafficking, um, which finances the terrorism. Uh, uh, in pretty good order. Uh, so we, uh, we put an element to deal with security in Plan Colombia. Uh, we uh, put a, an element in that deals with uh, crop eradication. And then finally, uh, we also put an uh, element in to deal with, with uh, alternative development, which you strongly advocated in your testimony. Uh, are you you're aware that at least a third of the funds that were in Plan Columbia were dedicated towards either economic uh, development or crop alternative programs? Yes, I am. And I agree on, on, on security. I wish that our 
assistance did more to protect actual Colombians and, and, and in, increase the strength of the state. What we did mainly was secure the fumigation program, and now we're proposing to secure a pipeline. That doesn't really affect the lives of most Colombians. Well, I think if you secure the terrorist uh, threat, uh, you uh, do provide security for the land and ability to also uh, conduct uh, business and uh, make a living. Uh, so we have about a th uh, well, we have in excess of over, over a third of the funds for those assistance programs. Uh, so I think it's a pretty good balance. I, I would have to say that uh, I've been personally disappointed that not only in the eradication and security areas, but also in the uh, economic development and I share that disappointment. development uh, programs. There have also been unnecessary delays, uh, bureaucratic. Uh, bungling and uh, uh, lack of progress. Uh, so we appreciate uh, that. I guess that would be your same observation. That would be my observation, yeah. too. I'm worried that the coverage is nowhere near what it should be. Right. And it does take all of those elements to make uh, this program successful. Well, I want to thank you. I tried to stall a bit to see if any of the minority members yeah, would return uh, since you our witness uh, from uh, requested from their side, but we do appreciate your participation, your patience, and uh, waiting until the uh, end, and also for your recommendations uh, to the panel on a very important uh, subject. So, we'll uh, excuse you at this time, and uh, we'll also see if they have any uh, questions uh, from the minority side uh, that they'd like to submit, and we've left the record uh, open uh, for that. Uh, uh, purpose. So thank you and your excuse, Mr. Thank Eisenhower. you for your invitation. And I did have one uh, article that I wanted to submit uh, to the record uh, by Mr. Burton and Mr. Gilman. Uh, it's dated uh, Thursday, October 29th, uh, commentary on heroin awakening without objection. Uh, this will be made uh, part of the uh, record today. Uh, there being no further business uh, before the, uh, the committee uh, today, uh, and this is a full committee meeting, isn't it? Um, excuse me. I'm usually uh, chairing the subcommittee, but uh, uh, this is uh, historic uh, in that we're addressing a very serious issue facing uh, the United States. It's also historic in that it's the last uh, hearing, I believe, of the Government Reform uh, Committee uh, in the 107th uh, Congress. I want to particularly thank the staff on both sides of the aisle for their cooperation, the members uh, for working uh, over the past year, our chairman uh, for his uh, leadership and our ranking member for his uh, leadership uh, uh, in one of the most important committees uh, in the House of Representatives that is charged with investigation and oversight of all of the activities of our federal government. So. Uh, there being no further business, uh, this, uh, this hearing and this committee uh, for the 107th Congress is uh, adjourned.
Antietam. 23,000 killed, wounded, or missing. It was the bloodiest day in American history, and it took place during the Civil War. The Antietam Battle Commemoration, a two-hour special, live Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific.